and the meeting is live, Chair Kinney. Thank you, Dina. Oh, At this okay. time, I would like to wish a good morning to Wasaga Beach, Her Worship, Deputy Mayor Bray, fellow councilors and staff. It's my pleasure to call to order this Wasaga Beach Coordinated Committee for Thursday, August the 19th, 2021. Moving down to disclosure of pecuniary interest. I see one at this time, it's from Her Worship, 4.6.5 public works accounts. And if there is any that is identified throughout this meeting, please notify the chair at the time. Uh, we'll start the community services section through deputations, presentations, petitions, and public meetings. Uh, we have two on the agenda this morning, and both fall within the realm of the development services and Councillor Foster's um, chair. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Councillor Foster to conduct the public meetings, please. Thank you, uh, Mark, I appreciate that. I just, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we do have two uh, public meetings today related to do two different uh, development proposals. Uh, there are, this has the potential to have a lot of speakers and, and that's fine, that's actually very good. But I do wanna remind people of some basic ground rules before I even get reading this. And, and again, I'll have the clerk uh, uh, buzz in if I need to, but basically both these public meetings, and I will read the proper script, but I go, remember, we're here to gather information on development proposals. The input is very valuable and will be received by staff and the developer, but there are no decisions being made today related to those uh, proposals. I will remind people this is a business meeting, not a Facebook forum, so no personal attacks on staff, council, developers, or the public will be tolerated. And that's where um, I think the clerk has the mute button. Uh, so again, we're not, this isn't gonna turn into a, a zoo of any sort. Uh, and this is also in accordance with our electronic meeting participation policy, which was provided to everyone who uh, wants to speak. And finally, with so many speakers, I will accept responses such as, I agree with the previous speakers as being totally acceptable. Um, remember Shakespeare said, brevity is art. So, taking that into uh, consideration, I will start the first public meeting. And this is the proposed amendment, <coughs> excuse me, proposed amendment to the Town of Osage Beach Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 20360 as amended. Sunnydale Concession 13 ESR Part Lot 4, Concession 14, Part Lots 4 to 6, Registered Plan 51R23365, Part 1, Registered Plan. 51R34466 part one and registered plan uh, 51R24467 part one and municipally described as 601 Sunnydale Road South. Notice of a public meeting was mailed to property owners within 120 meters of the subject property on July 29th, 2021 was circulated to all agencies, service providers, school boards by email as prescribed in the planning act a sign was posted along the frontage of the property on July 29th, 2021, and notice was advertised in the newspaper on July 29th, 2021. The provided 20 days of notice for the public meeting and the, uh, sorry, this provided 20 days of notice for the public meeting, and this meeting is therefore properly constituted as required by the Planning Act. As a result of the circulation of the notice of public meeting, the following written comments were received. Letters of support, none. Letters of no objection, Enbridge Gas expressed that they do not object to the proposed application. However, they reserve the right to amend their development conditions. The Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority provided they have no concerns with the proposed zoning and bylaw amendment. Letters of concern, public works staff have noted they do not oppose the proposed sorry, public works staff have noticed they do not oppose the proposed rezoning to permit linked dwelling units. Public works, however, does not support the request for a reduction of the setback of a driveway from the intersection to be reduced from nine meters to 5.2 meters. 
excuse me, letters of objection. Uh, one was received from Mr. Hillier of 630 Sunnydale Road. Ms. Hanna, have we received any further letters of correspondence in regard to this, in regard to this application? Uh, no, we have not. Excellent, thank you. Uh, town planning staff will now make a brief presentation and will provide further details with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. And I'll turn it over to town staff, please. There you go. And I'll be sharing the presentation today for Samantha. So just a moment while I get it up. Okay. I'm just going to go grab a clean Excuse me for a moment. And you can tell me if I've got the right one up here, please. Can I pull it up? Does everybody see my screen? No. Okay, it's on my secondary screen, so this might not be working. Share screen. Good. Um, no, that one's actually for the um, applicant. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Oh, sorry, this is the one. There we go. And that should be good now. Okay, so this is um, for public uh, meeting for application uh, Z04-21 for a zoning bylaw amendment made by Brook Valley Wasaga. Uh, this is for 601 Sunnydale Road South, uh, which is phase one of the Zancor River Z subdivision, formerly known as Sunnydale Trails. Uh, next slide, please. So just as an overview, first I will be introducing the application on behalf of the applicants. Um, I will then be presenting the subject lands and the proposed development, as well as providing a summary of the comments received to date um, next will be the outline of next steps, as well as a uh, time for questions and submissions. Uh, next, oh, sorry. So the purpose of the public meeting, um, a public meeting is required under the Planning Act for um, zoning bylaw amendment applications. Town staff are introducing the applicant's proposal to council and the general public. And this provides an opportunity for sharing of written comments and making oral submissions to coordinated committee. So the application for zoning bylaw amendment um, Z04-21 was submitted on behalf of Brook Valley Wasaga in May of 2021 and was deemed complete in July of 2021. The application proposes the rezoning of lands as well as variances for reductions and setbacks for driveways on corner lots for some of the lots that are within a draft plan approved subdivision. The subject property is located on the east side of Sunnydale Road South, north of Central Square Boulevard and south of the Nodosaga River. So um, the lands are municipally addressed as 601 Sunnydale Road South and are currently vacant. The frontage is 1,128.95 um, meters and it has a depth of approximately 960 meters and an area of 107.17 hectares. The surrounding land uses include vacant lands to the north and a proposed condominium development to the northwest. Um, the proposed residential, there's proposed residential to the east and south, and there's existing residential to the west, as well as a vacant golf course. So um, a joint notice of complete application and notice of public meeting was issued on July 29th, 2021 by publication in the newspaper. Um, mail a mail out to all landowners within 120 meters, as well as the installation of signage on the lands, as can be seen in the photo. 
So the property contains a number of designations this in, within the official plan. This includes the um, Natural Heritage System Category 1 and Category 2, special study areas, um, stormwater management, a stormwater management pond, low density residential, medium density residential, uh, open space, and institutional. So some of the uses permitted in low density residential designations include detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings, duplex dwellings, and accessory dwelling units. And for medium density residential des designations, semi-detached dwellings, linked semi-detached dwellings, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, Linkedin Street townhouses, and accessory dwelling units are permitted. Um, and designations on the land, oh, sorry. Designations on the land surrounding the subject property include natural hazards, open space, um, rural country club, community, and institutional. Uh, next, sorry. So um, this land is also uh, within multiple zoning categories. So the property is zoned residential type two exception 18 hold one zone, residential type two exception 18 hold two zone, residential type three exception 19 hold one zone, Residential type four exception eight hold one zone, institutional exception eight dash, residential type two exception 18 hold three zone, institutional zone, open space and environmental protection zone. The zoning bylaw amendment pertains to lands zoned in the residential type two and the residential type three zones. So within the R2 um, zones, permitted uses include um, a boarding house, duplex dwelling units, link dwelling units, single detached dwelling units, semi detached. Um, dwelling units and one accessory dwelling unit. And within the R3 um, zone permitted uses include street townhouse dwellings, um, townhouse dwellings uh, and one atta attached accessory dwelling unit. Um, some of the zoning that surrounds this property includes rural, environmental protection, environmental protection exception se seven, institutional exception one, open space, residential two, exception seven hold, residential two, exception six hold, Residential three exception 19 hold and residential three exception 29 hold. So this image um, shows the lands that are subject to the zoning bylaw amendment. So the lands that are identified in yellow on this map are where the linked dwelling units are proposed to be located. And the lots that are identified in red are where reduced driveway setbacks have been proposed. And then this is um, an image of the zoning bylaw amendment schedule A1 with the zoning that's currently um, on the lands. And this is an image of the um, proposed product that uh, the applicant has provided. Those are some linked um, dwellings. So uh, for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, um, it's being proposed for a rezoning of block 721 to 7. 31 on the approved draft plan of subdivision from R3 H1-39 to R2 H18. Um, as well, they are requesting a reduced interior yard setback for linked dwellings um, units. The current requirement is 1.2 meters, which is approximately four feet. And they're requesting for this to be reduced to 0 0.48 meters or approximately 1.5 feet. As well, they are requesting for a reduced driveway setback on corner lots from the required nine meters, um, which is about 29 feet uh, to 5.25 meters, which is approximately 17 feet. So some of the comments, uh, the comments that have been received um, to date, uh, Public Works does not oppose the proposed rezoning to permit linked dwelling units. Public Works does not support the request for a reduction of the setback of a driveway from an intersection to be reduced from nine meters to 5.25 meters. And Bridge Gas um, does not object, of, object to the proposed application, but has reserved rights to amend their development conditions. And DCA staff has no concerns with the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. And we have uh, received one public concern regarding driveway access. Uh, so this public meeting is required by the Planning Act. Town staff are presenting the applicant's proposal Town staff have not completed a detailed review of the application and staff will provide a recommendation report to council at a later date. In terms of next steps, planning staff will continue receiving and considering comments from the um, public and agency and departmental staff as well. Planning staff will prepare and submit a recommendation report. Uh, thank you. 
All right, thank you for that. I will now continue on. <clears throat> the property owner and representatives on their behalf, including the consulting planner from MHBC Planning, Mr. Patrick Towns, and their consulting engineer from Tatham Engineering, Ms. Doris uh, Casulo, are in attendance. Does the applicant or the representatives wish to make any, uh, provide any further details with respect to the proposed development? Thank you, Chair Foster. Yes, please, we'd like to make a brief presentation. Carry on. Uh, Ms. Lundy, are you able to share the presentation? Yes, I'm just getting it up now, one moment. Perfect, thank you. Okay, you should be able Excellent. to continue. Excellent, thanks in advance for uh, controlling that for me here. Um, thank you again, Chair Foster, and to the committee members for having me today. As mentioned, uh, I'm Patrick Towns. I'm a planner with MHPC Planning. I'm filling in today for Corey Chisholm, who's a partner with our office. Uh, he sends his regrets as he's not able to join today. Um, thank you, Planner Hannah, for the overview. I'll do my best not to repeat any major details, um, but would like to provide an overview of the application on behalf of our client, uh, Brook Valley Wasega, uh, as known for the site uh, River's Edge subdivision. So next slide, please. Uh, as described by staff, this slide shows the, uh, the boundary of the location of the site. Uh, next slide. Under background, it's important detail of this application. Uh, the site is already draft plan approved and the latest planning applications associated with the draft plan approval uh, went to council as late as 2020. Brook Valley has acquired the site and are working towards registration of the lots. Uh, there's absolutely no changes proposed to the approved draft plan that was considered through the original applications in 2020, but rather what I would refer to as technical amendments to introduce a new product type uh, being a linked dwelling unit. Uh, next slide, please. A linked dwelling unit is contemplated in the current zoning bylaw under the R2 zone. However, when the site was originally designed, this dwelling, it was not considered by the previous owner. A uh, linked dwelling unit looks from the street like a single detached, it's separated walls. Um, however, they are joined at the foundation below the grade. Uh, this is a dwelling type that our client has used in other municipalities on other sites. Uh, as a result of the proposed change in the dwelling types for a select number of existing lots within the plan, Amendments are required uh, to permit the unit type itself and to establish site-specific standards for that linked dwelling unit. Uh, other amendments are proposed to correct zoning error uh, where previously townhouses were permitted on the site. This was uh, an area always contemplated for semis, uh, now for linked, but that's just a correction to existing zoning and also, as mentioned, to reduce the setbacks for corner lots for driveways. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, as described by staff, the lots in yellow are proposed to change to uh, a linked dwelling unit where a semi-detached is currently uh, approved under the current zoning. And the lots in red show the, uh, the properties where the, the corner lots where the setbacks for the driveway are proposed to be reduced. Next slide, please. As described, a linked dwelling unit looks very similar to a detached dwelling from the street, uh, joined at the foundation under the ground. Uh, the proposed setback between the interior dwelling, uh, 0 0.48 meters on each side, uh, this was uh, designed in accordance with the requirements of the Ontario Building Code. Next slide, please. Uh, again, because a, a linked dwelling unit is not a permitted use, site-specific provisions are required to be implemented here. Uh, the interior wall separation is 0 0.48 meters uh, for each side, and then the exterior walls of the linked up dwelling units are 1.2 meters proposed. Other than the separation setback between the interior walls, the proposed setbacks uh, will remain the same uh, as they were previously for semi-detached dwellings uh, that were approved under the previous bylaw. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this slide uh, displays those provisions uh, that will be carried forward uh, for the new linked dwelling units other than that separation distance between the interior walls. Next slide, please. Uh, a zoning change as mentioned, these are the lots that the zoning is to be corrected on, uh, highlighted in red. Uh, they were zoned to permit townhouses, but really in, uh, in fact, they were uh, always designed for some detached under the draft plan. Next slide, please. 
uh, in order to facilitate the proposed development, uh, the goal is to provide appropriately sized driveways for corner lots. So that was the reasoning for the reduction to 5.25 meters for the setbacks from corners. Uh, this reduction was supported by a letter from Tatham Engineering. Uh, we understand that there are comments uh, in opposition from Public Works, but our team looks forward to reviewing those uh, with staff uh, after the public meeting prior to uh, taking a decision or recommendation to council later on. Uh, but we will be discussing uh, the comments further with uh, staff. Thank you. This slide just shows uh, basically areas where that driveway setback are to be reduced. Uh, there's varying setbacks um, throughout the subdivision. And again, we'll work with uh, Public Works to address these uh, after the public meeting. Just a brief overview of the policy in keeping with the previous approval of the plan. Uh, the proposed amendments are in line with provincial and local planning documents. These documents include policy language that encourage a range in housing types, and that's what's being accomplished, contributing to different housing types within the town. Next slide, please. And overall, the amendment is to permit the linked dwelling units, so permitted use on a select number of properties. Uh, linked dwelling units are use again contemplated in the current zoning bylaw but were never considered uh, when the site was designed by the previous owner. Uh, the setbacks and standards are equal to those of the semi-detached being carried forward of uh, carried forward from the previous approval and the reduction in driveway setbacks are proposed to provide an opportunity for adequately sized driveways. Next slide please. Uh, overall, the, uh, the proposed amendments are consistent and conform to the relevant planning documents. They're in keeping with the previous draft plan approval and uh, also contribute to housing types available within the town. Uh, we do know that a comment has been received from an adjacent landowner uh, on the west side of Sunnydale Road, who also provided uh, similar comments to council at the time the draft plan itself was considered. Uh, we understand that these comments relate to the realignment of the driveway uh, having to do with the entrance to the site. Uh, we do appreciate the comments and do wish just to clarify that this rezoning application being considered is for technical matters. They apply to uh, the existing lots and changing unit types. So with respect to the subdivision itself, there's no changes proposed to what is already approved. And uh, based on that, we're sure all of operational uh, requirements and matters related to the entrance uh, were dealt with council. Uh, at the time of the decision, uh, when they made a decision on the approved draft plan. So that concludes my presentation and welcome any questions or uh, comments. But again, as highlighted by Chair Foster, this is the public meeting, uh, no recommendation on the table, but we'll take everything back and address for a subsequent uh, council meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation to both staff and yourself. Um, I will, uh, we will open it up shortly to both the public and and uh, council to to have at it so to speak but let me get back to my script here okay thank you for that as as requested in the notice of public meeting as of 4 30 on tuesday august 17th there is a local resident that has registered in advance to make an oral submission at today's virtual public meeting uh i'll now open it up open up the meeting uh to the comments from the public and Madam Clerk, have we received have we received anybody else prior to or before the cutoff for for this presentation? We just have one member of the public that would like to speak on this application. Okay, would you introduce him, please? Yes, John Hiller. If you're um, listening, would you please turn on your camera and microphone, or if you're on the phone, um, just let us know that you're there. And just looking through the list, I don't see Mr. Hiller. Yes, I, I'm here. Yeah. Are you there? I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I am just trying to get, yeah, I'm not totally. Co um, we can hear you. Yeah. We can hear okay. you just fine. Yep, go ahead. Okay. No, I'm, I'm trying to get the video. You know. no, oh, it's no, okay. No. Okay. Anyway, no, what I was um, objecting to this is that. I have put in two objections to this subdivision, first in 2003, and the last one was at 2000 and, oh, there we are, and, there you and are. 18 at the council meeting, and um, with uh, assurance from at both occasions 
that the developer would get back to me to uh, address my concerns. Now, I'm just, I'm gonna turn this and hopefully you can see um, out my window, you see where my driveway goes and you'll see a truck across the road. That's where their main street is coming out. Now, the, I've been told that it's gonna be a signalized um, intersection and yeah, if that is the case, I cannot see how I would possibly get out of a driveway 20 feet away from a signalized um, uh, entrance, you know, to, in order to get into town. And you know, with that, I mean, it just shows, I think, that either the council or the uh, developer is not being very honest with the uh, concerns about the neighborhood. I have talked to the staff, you know, the uh, planning staff, and they told me there was never a traffic study done, which I find very hard to believe that a subdivision of this size was done without a traffic study. But they said they had no um, indication that a traffic study was ever done to show the impact on the people going into the cemetery, which is going to affect very much because that's right beside my driveway as well as myself. Um, the only comment I did get was from your planner, um, I think it was three planners ago, if not two, maybe only two, was why don't I just move my driveway? It's only been there for 50 years. I mean, you know, why not move it over? And yeah, if the, if the planner or the um, developer is th this uh, inconsiderate of what's going on, I can't see them you know, dealing with any objection from you know, works department or anything else about the corner. You know, the visibility on a, a corner, which they are asking for a, re a reduced um, uh, visibility you know, triangle, I guess, is you know, I think very important. And it shows the, I, I think the intent of the developer, you know, that he will not listen to um, any criticism you know, or you know, objection to his subdivision. So anyway, that's about the extent of my objection. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I will open it up if staff or the developer have any comment on that. Seeing none. Okay, your comments will be taken, into sir. And uh, thank you for that. I, I will suggest um, uh, dispersions on the honesty of council and developers is, is really on the edge of uh, propriety, but your comments are valid and we will, uh, they will be addressed and brought back to staff before it comes to council. And we will make sure at the council table that, uh, you know, this discussion continues. Is there anyone else, uh, Madam Clerk, there's no one else uh, related yes. to the public, correct? That's correct. And John, I'm just going to shut up your video at this point. Thank you for Thank you very attending. Much. Okay. So now I will ask members of the committee if they have any questions or comments regarding the proposed application. I see Councillor Kinney, then Wells. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Councillor Well, I mean, sorry, Foster. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, either to our planner or to our um, developer, um, Mr. Towns, I'm just wondering with the reduction of the corner lot area, and, and maybe that's a question you can't answer, but how will that impact snow removal um, in the subdivision? I'm just wondering about that concept. Anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you, Member Kinney, and through you, Chair Foster. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, and that's what uh, we assume public works comments were based on possible snow remover removal. Again, uh, Tatham Engineering has prepared a letter in support of the reduction. Uh, we're going to go back and discuss with staff. Uh, some of the lots have a larger setback than the 5.25 that's proposed. So uh, I think the next step is just for dialogue to take place between public works uh, engineering and the developer to uh, just solve that issue and come up with an agreeable setback that works uh, from an operational standpoint. All right, thank you for that. 
Uh, Councillor Wells, and I, sorry, I wasn't looking as if any other member of council, if they could just raise their card if they want to speak now. Councillor, okay, Watson. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Wells, floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Councillor Foster. Just, I guess, comment only. Um, I, and I understand that the 0.45 or 0.48 meter separation is, is apparently uh, from what I read, uh, approved or accepted within the Ontario Building Code. Um, I guess, however, when I look at that, uh, I'm wondering the advantage, uh, what are the advantages of going to a split um, foundation, uh, for want of a better word, um, for the sake of 0.45 meters that could be halved and added into the uh, original uh, semi-detached homes it just seems to me to be a total waste of space. Um, so from my point of view, as a developer, uh, wasting space to me does not make a whole lot of sense. Um, the second side of that for me is emergency services. If there is only a 0 0.48 separation through all of these homes going down and somewhere in the middle of all of this, there is some form of whether it's fire or medical emergency, uh, I, I don't see how emergency personnel will ever be able to get from the front to the back if that's where they're needed. Uh, I know I couldn't uh, pass through a, a 0.48 uh, meter uh, separation. So I guess I'm just looking at it and saying, I don't understand the rationale for the concept of cutting it down to basically useless space. Thanks. Okay, don't know if anyone wants to touch that. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, through you, Chair Foster, to Member Wells. Um, the desirability of the lot is it's a different unit type. It's worked well in other municipalities for the developer. Uh, the advantage is someone is essentially buying a single detached instead of a, a semi with a shared wall. So it is somewhat desirable and again, a unique uh, housing type, which provincial policy, local policy speaks to. So. Um, if there's an advantage of it uh, for an owner, it's it's just it, it function looks like a single detached. And again, the separation distances meet the building code. But uh, we'll look further into the question uh, regarding uh, like there's no windows on the interior walls either. And I'm sure there's fire considerations as you mentioned. But uh, we'll address those comments uh, following the public meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that. I just want to do a quick correction. Earlier in the uh, script, I had said. It was uh, Ms. Casulio. It's actually Mr., so I do apologize for that. Uh, Councillor Watson, I believe you were next to speak. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Um, I wonder if planning staff could address. Uh, I remember uh, Mr. Hillier, I, I remember the other two occasions in 03 and 16, I think that he mentioned that he talked about this issue with his driveway and, and the road coming out. Um, he mentioned that he was told there was no traffic study on this. I find that, that hard to believe that that was said. Uh, every development has to have that. So I was wondering if somebody could comment whether that study was done or not. Thank you. Uh, I don't know who wants to take that from a uh, staff point of view. I see Doug up there. Do you want to chat? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think I'm the only planner um, in the building who was working for the town back in 2005 when the uh, plan of subdivision was originally uh, approved by the town. Uh, I wasn't directly involved with that file so I can't tell um, the committee nor the public at this point whether that traffic study was done but as a norm a traffic study is typically performed uh, with this type of approval. What we can do is we can look into the file and we can follow up directly with Mr. Hillier and, uh, and confirm that the, the, the traffic study. Um, my recollection as well, uh, when this went to a public meeting as circa 2019 for revision to draft approval, Mr. Hillier brought this up at that point as well. And the applicant uh, was to discuss some mitigative measures with Mr. Hillier on his property. Um, so that's a discussion that we could further as well with Mr. Hillier to try to satisfy his concern. Um, and uh, it would be um, appropriate to bring in public works staff. Uh, Mr. Hillier noted in his comments that 
um, with a, a signalized intersection installed, uh, it may make it difficult for him to access uh, Sunnydale Road um, because of his existing driveway and, and potentially conflict with how the signalized inter inst um, intersection is designed. So I think that's a worthy discussion that we can have Mr. with Mr. Hillier and uh, potentially with public works staff. So uh, as, a, as a whole, um, it would have merit for staff and, and also for the developers representatives to um, reconnect with Mr. Hillier on, on his concerns. Thank you, Doug. And you'll CC council on any of that stuff? Yes, we would, we would. Please, yeah. yeah. Okay, I saw Councillor Watson with the follow-up and Councillor Belanche, you're next. Thank you, Councillor. I was just gonna thank uh, uh, Doug. Uh, he is a senior guy and, and he, he will remember that. And I would appreciate, and I'm sure Mr. Hillier would to get some feedback on it. Thank you, Doug. You're welcome. Councillor Belanche. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Foster. Uh, I'd just like in the public meeting to clarify, I had met uh, with Doug Heron that uh, all of the zoning in this subdivision uh, is not subject to a legal operation of an Airbnb, I believe. Um, I, I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, I can confirm that um, an Airbnb uh, would be permitted in any zone which allows for um, short-term accommodation, so a hotel, motel, um, or uh, basically a commercial accommodation zone. The zones in this plan of subdivision are primarily for um, full-on residential use. So the zones that were described by um, Samantha Hanna in her presentation to the public and to committee, um, the R2 zones, there was uh, multiple residential zones, none of those zones would permit an Airbnb or any form of short-term rental. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Doug. Just a follow-up to the developers. Uh, my understanding is uh, there was uh, some uh, promotion uh, on social media indicating or encouraging that uh, some of these areas uh, could be used for Airbnb. I don't, uh, I'm not suggesting it was uh, anyone related to the developer, but someone uh, certainly promoting that uh, uh, that area as being desirable and that uh, that could be a use. So I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. You're, you're not implying that uh, something on social media is inaccurate, are you, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Back to the script then. Uh, if there's nothing else, thank you. Uh, and thank you to uh, the developer and to staff who, for their uh, responses to that. So comments received today will be considered and a decision on this application will be made at a future meeting as to whether committee will recommend the proposed zoning bylaw amendment to proceed further through the approvals process. And when receiving notice of the public meeting will receive notice of council's decision on this matter. If you did not receive notice of the public meeting and would like to receive a copy of the notice of council's decision, please co uh, contact planning department, leave your name and address to be added to the circulation list to make a written request to the clerk of the town of Wasaga Beach. If there's nothing else, I will declare this public meeting closed. I don't have a gavel, but there, my glass. <coughs> We're gonna move to the second public meeting. Thank you, everyone. One of the things I did not mention, thank you for everyone. Uh, one of the things I did not mention um, when I did my opening comments is over my shoulder, I have a little digital assistant, which I have an alarm set for 1030. So if I'm still in this chair at 1030, we are taking a break immediately after whatever speaker is on at the time that uh, 1030 alarm goes off. And again, I will remind people, brevity is art to those who may be presenting uh, and on behalf of other people, because the list for the public, the list of people who were interested in speaking is two pages long. Um, so I will, if, if any of the presenters are speaking for, on behalf of, of a group of people, if they could just say, you know, I'm representing 15 residents, 20 residents, whatever. I will also comment, um, and it's in the script, but I will point out, we've received uh, a, a myriad of, of letters and presentations. So I, I do appreciate the, uh, the amount of work that uh, people have done to provide us uh, a good solid uh, 
background on, on, on their objections. But let me move into the public meeting on the script. Okay, this is the proposed official plan amendment bylaw, uh, so zoning bylaw amendment, comprehensive zoning bylaw 2360 as amended and draft plan of vacant land condominium to the town of Wasaga Beach. Lots 34 and 35 concession three, Beachwood Developments, Inc. Notice of public meeting was mailed to property owners within 120 meters of the subject property on July 29, 2021 was circulated to all agencies, service providers, and school boards by email, as prescribed in the Planning Act. Two signs were posted along the frontage of the property on July 29, 2021, and notice was advertised in the local newspaper on July 29, 2021. This provides the 20 days notice for the planning meeting, and this meeting is therefore properly constituted as required by the Planning Act. The purpose and effect of the proposed official plan amendment, the zoning bylaw amendment, and draft plan of vacant land condominium would facilitate the development of 33 single detached dwellings, 48 townhouses, and approximately 134 units of high density development in the form of condominium units that are two in two to six story buildings. As a result of the circulation of notice of public meeting, the following written comments were received. Letters of support, one. Letters of no objection. Canada Post provided details, detailed comments regarding mail delivery to the proposed new residences. Hydro One Networks, Inc. expressed that they have no uh, comments or concerns regarding the proposed development. Letters of concern, none. Letters of objection, approximately 45 letters of objection have been received as well as a signed petition containing 1,814 signatures. Mr. Weatherall, have we received any further letters or correspondence in regard to this application? Todd? Thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, we received approximately 10 more additional letters of objection since the cutoff on uh, Tuesday at 4.30. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so that would bring it up to approximately 55 letters. Anyway, town planning staff will now make a brief presentation and will provide further details with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision. So I'll turn it back to you, Todd, go ahead, please. Or, or whoever's speaking for town. Thank you, Councillor Foster. I'll be presenting the staff uh, presentation. So the town of Wasaga Beach received an application for an official plan amendment, OPA 0221, as well as a zoning bylaw amendment. Previous slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, zoning bylaw amendment Z0121, as well as a draft plan of vacant land condominium, PS0121 by Beachwood Development Inc. Next slide. The overview of the, uh, the presentation will introduce the application on behalf of the applicant. Uh, we'll present the subject lands and the proposed development that is contemplated. We'll also provide a summary of comments received to date, as well as outline the next steps, as well as receive questions, and questions or comments on the submissions. Next slide. This public meeting is required under the Planning Act for application for an OPA or fish plan amendment, a ZBA, as well as a draft plan of vacant condominium. Town staff are introducing the applicant's proposal to council and to the general public. This opportunity is to provide for sharing of written comments and making oral submissions to the coordinated committee. Application for the OPA 0221, ZBA 0720, and draft plan condominium 0121 well, were submitted on behalf of Beachwood Developments Inc. in September of 2020 and were deemed complete of April of this year. The application proposed a development on the property legally described as part of lot. 34 and 35 concession three. The property is located on the north side of Beachwood Road and south of Shore Lane. As you can see in the aerial photo, uh, the subject land is basically as stated earlier, north of Beachwood Drive, south of Shore Lane and west of 71st Street. There is not a municipal number, 911 number assigned to the subject land as it's currently vacant. The property has an irregular frontage as well as a regular lot depth. It is currently approximately 5.88 hectares in size or 14.54 acres. Surrounding land use 
include residential as well as large tracts of vacant lands. As Chair Foster stated in the script earlier, uh, the notice of public meeting was issued on July 29th by publication in the local newspaper, as well as to all landowners with 120 meters. Uh, two signs were installed on the property, one on Beechwood Road, as well as one uh, through an access point on Shore Lane. Under the town's official plan, the property is designated residential. Uh, designations in the surrounding area include residential as well as a local commercial block that is southeast of the subject lands. Uses permitted in the resident residential designation include detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings, as well as accessory dwelling units. Currently under the zoning bylaw 2003-60 as amended, the subject land is currently zoned residential one hold, as well as the residential one zone. Uses permitted in the residential one zone include single detached dwellings as well as one attached accessory dwelling unit. The applicant has provided a conceptual site plan as you can see um, kind of on the southwest uh, is some townhouse proposals along Beechwood Road, correct, right where Dean has got the cursor. Uh, north of that are will be single families with a mix of townhouses and to the large blocks on to the east, just uh, fronting on Beechwood, just south of where the cursor is, is, will be two buildings at high density, six stories and high, six stories high, which will be considered like a condominium apartment slash buildings. Next slide. The applicant has submitted an official plan amendment application to allow for an overall density of the lands of 51 units per net residential hectare. Policies in the town's official plan identify that Generally, density that is more than 37 units per net residential hectare is considered high density development, which requires an official plan amendment. The effect of this amendment would be to permit a high density residential apartment building at a density of 87 units per net hectare by way of site specific policy to the current designation. Next slide. Here is the, uh, the proposed official plan amendment schedule that was provided by the developer. So you can see the land subject to the OPA, which goes around the subject lands, as well as lands to be designated residential high density and lands to be designated open space, which is basically um, a drainage block and a stormwater management pond. Next slide. The zoning bylaw application will recognize the development of the property with varied development standards, such as, but not limited to a reduced frontage, lot area, decreased interior side yard setbacks, and increased lot coverage. A zoning bylaw amendment to the residential type one exception zone, exception to the residential type three exception zone, as well as the residential type four exception zone. An open space zone is proposed to facilitate the development of the lands. The zoning bylaw amendment will permit the proposed land uses on the site and introduce development standards that will facilitate the, the proposed uses. So here is a schedule that was provided that I developed earlier, as well as a chart matrix of the zoning bylaw relief requested. As you can see from what's being required under the R1 zone, the R3 and the R4 zone, uh, the highlighted table is what they're proposing. As you can see, they're requesting relief in a lot of the categories. Um, for the R1 zone, which is your single family dwellings, they're looking at a reduction in frontage, lot area, front yard, side yard, from the interior, exterior, as well as rear yard, and increasing the maximum lot coverage. Under the R3, which is your zone that permits townhouses, they're looking for a lot frontage reduction from lot frontage from 27 to 6 meters per unit, um, reduction in the minimum lot area, the minimum front yard depth, uh, your side yard setbacks for townhouse dwelling units, as well as the exterior, rear yard, and increasing the maximum lot coverage. And the residential type 4 exception zone is requested, which is your high density, your apartment building. The two apartment building condos, they're looking at going from 12 meters to 21 meters to accommodate the proposal. Next slide. They're also looking for some relief from the general provisions in the zoning bylaw 2003-60, which are basically uh, encroachments into the Porsche Brandes areas, uh, as well as the steps accessibility ramps, reduction in the parking requirements, under the R3, uh, they're looking at the minimum reduction in width per unit for the townhouses or street townhouse units, as well as they're looking for relief in the required play areas, as well as the privacy yards under the condominium zone in the R4 zone. Next slide. 
Some comments that have been received to date, NBCA currently not in support of the proposed development. Wasaga Town Engineering, no position taking. Uh, some outstanding matters need to be addressed as part of their second submission. Canada Post has no position taking, as well as Hydro One, no comments or concerns. Uh, as Councillor or Councillor Foster or Chair Foster has stated earlier, we received numerous letters of objections. Uh, I'm not going to summarize every letter of objection, but a lot of the common uh, points or facts that were identified in the concerns were existing and proposed flooding, uh, out of character, concerns with species at risk, concerns with loss of wetlands, concerns with loss of shoreline trail, uh, infrastructure concerns, increased traffic, increased noise, increase in population, impact on the beach and the beach access, possible Airbnb concerns, as well as loss of property values. We did receive a uh, comment in support and their comments were basically provide more housing options, potential for more amenities in the area once development occurs, as well as proposal will provide, uh, will provide an approved new drainage plan that will address old flooding issues. Next slide. Uh, so this, this public meeting is required under the Planning Act. The town staff are presenting it, this application and proposed for the applicant. Town staff have not completed a detailed review on the applications and the future staff will provide a recommendation report to council at a later date. And the next steps, as uh, stated earlier, we'll continue to receive comments and consideration from the public agencies or department staff. Planning staff will then prepare a recommendation report to council. Uh, please feel free to anybody that needs to provide more information or additional comments, please send it to senior plan dev at wasagabeach.com. That is planning staff presentation. Thank, Thank you. you very much for that, Todd. Appreciate it. Um, I'll continue on then. The property owner and the representatives uh, on, on their behalf, including the consulting planner from Jones Consulting, Ms. Brandy Clement, and their consulting team are in attendance. Does the applicant or their representatives wish to provide any further details with respect to the proposed development? I see Brandy there. Uh, the floor is yours if you'd like it. Yes, thank you. We do have a presentation that we would like to present, please. Thank you. And uh, you could just advance to the next slide. That's fine. I am. Um, my name again is Brandy Clement. I am a partner with the Jones Consulting Group. I'm also a project planner. And I am going to provide as brief as I can of a presentation, but knowing that there's a quite a bit of interest from the public. There are some areas that I did want to get into a little bit more detail on uh, that certainly wasn't part of the town's presentation. But again, the lands on the side are identified in red. Uh, they are located along Beachwood Road, south of Shirlane and west of 74th Street with access provided or frontage provided, excuse me, on three different roadways. They're currently vacant and primarily surrounded by residential uses, although there are small pockets of commercial. Uh, next slide, please. I will note that uh, after our presentation, we're certainly here to answer any questions and the entire consulting team that prepared all the reports and supported this submission are also here today to answer any questions committee or the public may have. So we've submitted three applications as mentioned, the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications. I will discuss in a little bit more detail as we move forward. The last application is a draft plan of vacant land condominium. And I just wanted to explain that in a very brief detail, as I know it's sort of a new application uh, with the municipality, but it will create the, the lots or the units on the property. It's a freehold condominium where the purchasers buy the building, they buy the land around it, but then they share in the common areas. So the difference with other condominiums is that uh, the lots are created uh, when the plan is registered, but the buildings themselves do not have to be built, where in other condominiums like standard or common element condos, those units have to be built before you can register the plan of condominium. The two buildings that uh, we're proposing, the two six-story buildings, will then be on these particular blocks within the vacant land condo, and then they will move forward as their own type of condominium as you can't have buildings or a um, condo unit building uh, in a vacant land condominium. The open house that we had for the, for the residents was to introduce the project to the neighborhood as well as 
Uh, it was open to any members of uh, staff or certainly uh, council that wanted to attend. That was on June 23rd, and we certainly received quite a bit of uh, good feedback from the neighbors on uh, the open house and on the, the, the project itself that we are proposing. Uh, the next slide, please. So this is the vacant land condominium. Essentially, it's like a draft plan of subdivision, except the lots are called units. And this is what it will look like. You'll see the two larger blocks that are provided. Again, those are called units, uh, is where the, the two buildings are proposed for and their associated parking lots. Next slide, please. And this is just the same version, but just colored. Um, in total, we're presenting or proposing, excuse me, 215 units. We have a mix of a single attached units, total of 33, a total of 48 townhouse units up to two stories, and then the two six-story condominium buildings with a total of 134 units uh, dispersed between the two, so 67 units in each building. Uh, lot frontages will range for the single detached dwellings from nine to 12 meters, and the townhouses are proposed at six meters wide. The lot areas for the singles will range from 250 to 500 square meters, for the townhouses, they will range from 186 to 333 square meters. The roads are provided at 10 meters in width, which does meet the town standards for private roadways. Parking is provided in driveways as well as the garages. All of the units have been designed to accommodate the required parking spaces, so we're not proposing parking along the roadways. And then for the buildings, of course, you see the adjacent parking lots that will provide parking for those units. Main entrance to the site will be off Beachwood Road. We do have a secondary access that we are proposing along the future Betty Boulevard. And this secondary access was required by both the Ministry of Transportation as well as the town. There is further a transit stop along Beachwood Road at 74th Street that does provide access to anyone that may live in this subdivision that doesn't drive to the Lynx transit system. There is one single detached lot that is proposed out to Shore Lane. Uh, you can sort of see it on the, the north part of the plan, northeast part of the plan. That will be, as we move forward, we'd like to sever that out of this, so it's not part of the condo plan. This is a, a lot that's uh, 20 meters wide today uh, that will remain as such and uh, provide a single detached dwelling out to Shore Lane. As you can see there's a stormwater management facility that's proposed on the north side. I will note that there's been, uh, you know, careful details been put into the design of this, uh, of the, the condominium, of the layout of it. We have the single detached dwellings that are located more on the north end of the plan, adjacent to the existing single detached dwellings to the north. There are only, as you can see, five lots that share a common property line with the existing residential to the north. And then with the rest of that, uh, sharing a, a property line with the proposed stormwater management facility. The townhouses have purposely been uh, sited in the middle to the south side of the plan, closer to Beachwood Road. And then the buildings themselves have been sited furthest away from the adjacent development to not only minimize any impact to the existing residential, but as well to allow for that direct access to that primary access point at Beachwood Road, which alleviates some of the traffic that will go along the, the local area roadways uh, to, the, to the south as well as it provides that direct access to the transit stop for those that um, need that, that are living in those buildings. We are proposing a parkland block on the west side of the plan, as you can see. This is not quite one acre in size. <coughs> Excuse me. It will be a public park, so it will not be part of the uh, overall condominium plan will be dedicated to the municipality. And I dare say it, it could be one of the only public parks for this type of use in the West area of town. So we see that it would be something that not only could these residents that are located within the uh, proposed development utilize, but the, the greater area could certainly utilize. There'll be trees as we move forward that will be planted uh, for buffers between the existing uses and the proposed uses, as well as on the east side around the parking lot. The condo units that are proposed, we see these as providing a more affordable housing style in the town. Um, it's needed for those entering into the market, for those perhaps downsizing. This style of housing is not prevalent in this area. It's in a good location. It has direct access to Collingwood, 
um, access to amenities within the town as well as in an area uh, where the town envisions seeing growth in the West End. Uh, as mentioned, the density overall uh, on just the, the residential lands, when you consider just the residential lands taking out roadways, the, the stormwater pond, et cetera, uh, you're at around 51 units per net hectare for the entire site. The next slide, please. <clears throat> so this just gives you a little snippet of the design of the units themselves. Uh, some earth tones are being proposed in sort of the, the grays and the browns. Uh, there'll be a mix of uh, housing materials on the exterior, uh, being some wood siding or some, um, some stone finishes. This design of the units really has been given some careful consideration. It's gone through many iterations. It will complement the area, not only immediately, but the type of development that you see in the, in the greater surrounding area as well. Next slide, please. Applications submitted in this area certainly need to conform with the A Place to Grow growth plan as well as be consistent with the provincial policy statement. The uh, policies on this slide have been identified as the more relevant policies within these documents that provide support for the applications. So very generally, the lands are within the settlement boundary and adjacent to the built boundary. This type of development contributes to the towns providing complete communities. It provides a diverse mix of housing types with various price points they can be offered at in a compact form with access to transit, different shopping areas, recreational uses. Uh, it intensifies this property at an appropriate scale. There's a public park provided for, for recreational purposes and there will be full municipal services extended to the property for the development. There's certainly been a number of uh, different reports and studies that have also been prepared that have been submitted in support of these policies. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, the lands are currently designated in the OP as residential. There is a small pocket in the middle on Schedule D that is part of the Natural Heritage System uh, overlay. The amendment that we are proposing will then designate the entire property except for the pond and the park, which will be designated as open space, the rest of the property being designated as residential high density. So the town section 5.2.6 of the official plan recognizes that high density areas are allowed low and medium density uses as well as it adds apartment uses uh, within that. The density is not to exceed 74 units per net hectare overall or generally not exceed. And anywhere where you are proposing this, it requires an official plan amendment, which is why we are submitting for that today. Section 5.2.6.1 identifies locational attributes that must be considered when you're uh, identifying high density uses in the municipality. So I won't go through those in detail, but very generally we feel the site is appropriate for high density use due to the proximity to Beechwood Road, which is a collector roadway, due to the proximity of transit services, the proposed parkland for recreational facilities, the availability of schools in the area, shopping in the area, buffering that can be provided to the adjacent uses, the nominal impact to the street network, availability of the municipal services that can be extended to the land, and the fact that there's um, today no other high density uses in this area. Next slide, please. Lands are currently zoned residential type one and type one hold on the east side of the property. The zone permits single detached dwellings only, so we have submitted for a zoning bylaw amendment. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, the schedule that we are proposing. Uh, Todd went into this in, in pretty good detail in his presentation, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, but I will reiterate that for the single detached dwellings, you can see on the screen, those are the R1-X zones and the X representing the exceptions to the development standards, which generally represent slight reductions in the lot frontage and area, as well as the front side and rear yard setbacks and then increased lot coverage. Uh, similarly, with the townhouses, which you can see on the schedule as the R3-X, we're proposing very similar uh, reductions in the development standards. And then the buildings you see for the R4-X, uh, one, uh, one of the main development standards we're asking to vary is to increase the building height. The, and then there are, as noted, um, other requests to vary the, some of the general provisions. The parkland and the open space, or in the stormwater management plan, excuse me, will be zoned as open space. 
Next slide, please. So I've gone into a little bit more detail on this servicing slide. This, um, there were a lot of uh, public members at the open house that had questions about servicing. So I did wanna provide a little bit of uh, time and detail to this slide. The, in terms of sanitary servicing, the internal sanitary sewer collection system will be discharging to the existing sanitary sewer onshore lane. The capacity of the existing downstream sanitary sewer system has been confirmed by, confirmed by the town. There are no upgrades required for this. With respect to water servicing, both domestic and fire prevention, this will be provided by a water main that will be looped through the development with a connection to the existing municipal water main on Shore Lane and a second connection to the existing water main on Betty Boulevard. With regard to grading, in the pre-development condition, the property generally slopes from south to north. The proposed development will similarly slope from south to north, but it will be raised so that there can be direct drainage to the stormwater management facility. With regard to drainage, in the current pre-development condition, the stormwater drainage generally leaves the property in the three locations that are identified on the slide. In the development condition, the drainage to both the eastern and the central outlet, which is the area that's historically prone to the seasonal flooding, will be improved by lessening the flow to both outlets. So that's achieved through the site grading and, and the collection of the rainwater from the majority of the property and control through the on-site storm pond. And lastly, with regard to stormwater management, the on-site pond that's proposed will treat and control storm drainage from the development it provides both enhanced quality and quantity control in accordance with ministry and municipal guidelines and standards. The outlet is to the proposed municipal channel that's located along the western boundary of the property. So that is within the park block right on the western area of the land running north-south, continuing through to the immediate north and then eventually outlets to the bay. Approximately 87% of the development is proposed to drain to this western channel, directly or through the stormwater pond, and then approximately 11% and 2% drain to the east and south outlets respectively. Next slide, please. So this is just simply a, um, a visual version, if you will, of what I just explained, and it's more there for if there's questions moving forward, um, our project engineer can refer back to this slide. Next slide, please. With regard to traffic, as I mentioned, there is a primary access off Beachwood and a secondary access out to Betty Boulevard. There are upgrades that have been identified in the traffic impact study that are required at the Beachwood and Joan Avenue intersection. So that's a westbound left turn lane and an eastbound left turn lane. All site distances have been reviewed for the proposed access points and they are considered suitable. The development does not cause any operational issues. It does not significantly delay or create congestion on the local road networks. And the traffic study also looked at a reduced parking uh, requirement for the buildings. And we are looking at proposing 1.54 spaces per unit, which has been justified in that traffic impact study. The next slide, please. This slide just outlines uh, for everyone all of the information that was submitted in support of the applications. And last slide, please. So lastly, to conclude my presentation, the proposed applications will allow for the intensification of a, a site at what we feel is an appropriate level with a mix of uses that promote complete communities. It provides a range of housing types and densities at different price points, allowing for more affordable units being created. The lands are within the settlement boundary of the town. They're adjacent to the built boundary. The applications conform to the policies of the Place to Grow Growth Plan. They're consistent with provincial policy statement, as well as they conform to the policies of the county's official plan and the town's official plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brandy. Appreciate that. Are we back? There we are. <laughs> All right. I'm going to carry on then. Um, Madam Clerk, you had something. Here. Yes, thank you, Chair Foster. Um, if we can just have the public, uh, Liam, would you mind just turning off your video for a while? We'll call upon you when we're ready. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back to my script here. Uh, as required in the notice of public meeting, as at 
4.30 p.m. on Tuesday, August 17th. 29 residents have registered in advance to make oral submissions on today's virtual public meeting. I'm gonna, the tap, well, I'm gonna open up the public meeting to hear comments from the public. Reminding people, we are here to discuss the merits of the proposal and we will not tolerate, um, you know, personal attacks on anyone. So uh, with that being said, uh, and, and I do want to remind again, I said that if you're representing uh, a group of people, we appreciate that. We want to hear who, uh, you know, who you're representing. So it becomes part of the record, please. Madam Clerk, I'll turn it over to you, please. Thank you, Chair Foster, through you. Um, the first speaker we have uh, ready to speak is Alexander Schwertner. Alexander, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and turning on your video and we're ready for you. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Councillor Foster, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And thank you, Mayor Bifalci, Deputy Mayor Bray, and Council for joining our meeting. And I really appreciate your attention to the matter. Um, just by introduction, my name is Alexander Schwertner. I'm a resident at 2189 Shore Lane, and I'm directly adjacent to the property we're talking about today. You may be a bit concerned about that long list of speakers. Um, I'm trying to just summarize some of the contents of that long speaker list. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Brox Beach Neighborhood Association. A number of individuals have, I believe, have registered to speak today and they have waived their time to give me more time to go through their arguments on their behalf. I have a list of names. I can read them out or I could alternatively post them into the Zoom chat, whatever works better and looking for advice here. I will ask the clerk. I I actually, personally, I would believe that I'd like to hear the list of names because it's on that huge long list. If council doesn't object, if you could just, we don't need the addresses and emails. But I <laughs> okay. do believe that everyone's voice should be heard. Uh, so unless council okay. has to object. Will... Okay, go ahead, please. I will go and read the list. So on my list are Terry and Judy Pirias. Debbie Dennis, Barbara Kendrick, Robin Plump, Judy Muddy, Carrie Atkins, Brian and Pat Whiteford, Zanon and Gail Konosevsky, Nick and Taylor Savage, Paula and Jeff DeHaas, Yvette Gauthier, Kathy and Robert Summerson. I'm not naming a couple of other individuals who I'm also representing, but who would also want to speak today. And I don't want to take away their time. So I'll leave it at that list and just, just being cognizant of their right to speak. Um, beyond the group that I mentioned, we have had a lot of conversations, easily talked to more than 100 residents over the past couple of weeks, and they share the same concerns. And some of them have sent their own letters to, to the planner. I have pre prepared a presentation today that, that will take us to the concerns of the group. Um, I've shared the presentation with the clerk and I believe council has the presentation in front of them. Anyone else who wants to follow along, it's available on our website, safebeachwood.ca under the news section. So you can download it there and follow along. For those who have the presentation in front of them, um, let's go to page two of them. So we've heard earlier about the applications to rezone the property um, for high density development and to allow construction of 215 units. I will share today why the residents in the affected neighborhood and beyond strongly object to this material change that contradicts the current official plan as we believe. And it will come no, as no surprise that at the end that I sincerely hope staff and council will conclude this consultation and decision process with a rejection of all three of those applications. Um, I've already mentioned briefly our website that summarizes our arguments for anyone who wants to know more about why. And uh, Mr. Weatherall has, has mentioned the petition against the application and we'll hear more about that later today. Going to the next slide. Summarizing um, six arguments that we will hear about today. And that is kind of the agenda for my presentation. Um, we will hear about the application's inconsistency with the current official plan of the town. We will hear about the destruction of protected coastal wetlands, which is inconsistent with the 2011 official plan amendment and also the NVCA comment received for the application. 
we'll hear about the inconsistency with the Ontario's growth plan, as well as the County of Simcoe's official plan. We'll discuss the substantial adverse changes to the character of the surrounding neighborhood. We'll talk about the potential for the actual development exceeding the current proposal. And we'll ultimately talk about our strong belief that Mr. Weatherall and by extension town and council should and need to drive planning if such a significant change to the official plan is at stake. Um, but let's start with the official plan and moving on to the next slide of our presentation. We're all aware that not only this property, but most of the area, aside from small commercial pockets, is currently zoned as low residential, um, low density. In, in fact, the current official plan specifically mentions the area west of 71st Street in section 5255 and discourages even medium density development in the area. Um, I've heard that a new official plan may be in preparation with the town's planning department, but for the time being, the current official plan is still the plan and it's valid. And it's really, really clear about preserving low density residential zoning in this area. Um, and that plan is important. It, it is an important guidance for, for the residents and developers who've built and bought homes in the area. And we as residents expect that future development is consistent with the currently valid plan and our community in, and at least that should be the case until a new um, official plan has been adopted, which is not yet the case. The current zoning and planning designation also results in a situation where there's no business or amenities or services infrastructure anywhere near the proposed development. It's a couple kilometers away, but aside from a few singular shops, there's really nothing in that area. And the typical argument in favor of high density development is that creating residential density helps local businesses and services because they get a critical mass of customers nearby. But none of that really applies for the property in question. There's nothing there. We have existing commercial hubs in town and that could in fact benefit from higher density. And that as far as I remember was a key argument in the downtown development plan where there was also a suggestion of high density residential development along Main Street. So that argument is valid. It's just not valid for this area. Um, and the proposed development might make sense in downtown, but it would, and there it would also fit into the planning vision that the town has already established. But for where we're talking about it right now, it does not make sense at all. It's far from stores, schools, or any, any healthcare providers. Moving on to the next slide, let's talk about the wetlands for a second. Um, there are, in fact, 50% of this property is covered by wetlands. And those are protected coastal wetlands designated as natural heritage category one or two. That tells us someone has taken a close look at those, those wetlands and thought about them. They're just not wet spots. They're actually something that, that shows up in a town map. Um, as required for development applications, and we've heard about that, the town has asked the NBCA for the review and comment on the proposal. And I'm not going into detail because everyone knows in, in, in of the coordinated committee what that proposal was, but it came back with a really clear statement that they cannot support the application in its current form because it would remove and irre irrevocable destroy those wetlands. They would just be gone. And for this application to move forward, the NBCA required a long list of more than 25 changes to that proposal. And the most notable change they requested for any kind of future development in this area would be to preserve the wetlands, so not to touch them, and also respect the 30 meter buffer around them. So that would leave only a smaller portion of the 14 acre area eligible for any kind of development at all. Um, won't go into further detail, um, you have the comments, but I will say and ask council to take those comments to heart when deciding about this proposal and, and not override the NBCA's very valid and relevant valid and relevant concerns. And why am I asking for this? Protecting those wetlands isn't just some lofty ecological goal. Removing them will have really tangible impacts on our neighborhood. They're keeping basements from flooding today as they act as buffers, and they keep water in the bay clean as they filter pollutants before they get into the water. Not having these wetlands in our backyard really makes a difference. 
And I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one who's really on board with protecting those wetlands. In fact, the town itself decided as early as 2011 that those specific wetlands contribute to the natural heritage of our community. And they adopted an amendment to our official plan back then to put them under protection. Moving on to the next slide, um, we often hear about the Ontario A Place to Grow plan or the growth plan as it's usually referred to. And the argument is that the plan wants Wasaga Beach to grow more rapidly and that its development is needed to support that. However, that growth plan has a much more balanced approach to growth than many may think. And in, in fact, section four of that plan has a mandate to protect what is valuable. That's the, the section or the header of that section. Now, the complete destruction of nat natural heritage wetlands, as it is proposed with that application, is clearly not in line with what this mandate seeks to protect. Instead, the growth plan is calling for this development in reality what is in actually inconsistent with that growth plan. The plan wants to grow, but it also recognizes that certain areas need to be except for that to, to keep that balance. So that proposal is in fact not consistent with the growth plan. And another popular container that I've heard a lot about to justify why the town would need this development is the County of Simcoe's official plan, which in its 2019 residential land budget sets population targets for the town. So if we take a closer look at those targets, they set a target population for Wasaga Beach at 27,000 residents by the year 2031. Let's do a little math. Based on the 2016 census and some more recent population counts on the town's website, um, I've just done some trend and uh, my calculations put me at 24,000 residents by now. The town may know better, but that's kind of the number that I came up with. So that means that for the remaining 10 years, from now until 2031, we are set to add 3,000 more residents in all of Osaga Beach. So now the land budget assumes an occupancy rate of two and a half per unit. That takes us to 1,200 units that we need to add in total over the next 10 years, or 120 units per year. Again, I don't have the exact numbers. The town planner may have those, but um, there are many active developments, many approved developments. Um, and I was looking at the town's development map when, when it was still online. And from what I remember, I'm fairly certain that the units outlined there exceed by far what is required to meet the county's land budget. So just with the plan and active development stock, we would also already achieve this target. So those 250 units that are added by this development that we're talking about today are not required at all to meet that plan's objectives. There is no urgency to add that development in. Moving on to the next slide. Um, I'm assuming that the planner and probably many, if not all members of council are at least somewhat familiar with the character of the Prox Beach area. Part of the traditional neighborhood of cottages, single family homes, running the entire stretch of Shore Lane. Um, and we like to believe that this character is quite unique and, and many even consider it to be part of the town's cultural heritage just after probably Beach One, which is even more known. Um, now, this proposal would be turning this neighborhood upside down. Not much would be left. Um, the existing official plan we've heard has this area as low density. So existing roads are built as single lane and they don't even have sidewalks. And I'm talking about Shore Lane and Betty Boulevard. And that is absolutely appropriate for, for the development stock that we have there today. But those roads in their current form are not capable to carry the additional traffic and they would require a substantial upgrade and widening. And that would not only change the look and feel of the neighborhood, but also turn those tranquil side roads that we have today suddenly into busy thoroughfares. It's just a lot of people who need to get in and out of those units. It definitely changes. Of course, yes, you can upgrade roads, but it has an effect on that neighborhood. There's also the, the Shore Lane Recreational Trail that's frequently used and enjoyed by many residents of Wasaga Beach, and that includes both residents in the area as well as many cyclists or, or hikers that, that we meet there. It, it is used by a lot of people, and we would not want to lose that trail to a paved road as an extension of Betty Boulevard. So long story short, anyone who's, who's been to the neighborhood will realize that 
high density housing just does, does not fit in any part of this traditional neighborhood. Moving on to the next slide, if we take a look at the proposed development plan submitted along with the rezoning application, you'll see that it does not build out to the maximum density that would be permitted under R4 with exceptions. We are concerned that this proposal serves as a bait and switch with the sole purpose of obtaining easier approval for the rezoning. It's not unheard of in other circumstances that once rezoning has been approved, that rezoned land could be sold to another developer at a higher price and or the plans are changed to build even more than the 250 units proposed today to increase profits. The same is possible for the conceptual designs that we've seen. Today, we see higher end architectural features and materials. A different developer may propose quite a different um, look and feel for those designs and once we actually had to construction. And, and that is possible and, and we can't know if that's happening or not. But what we are asking council is to review the rezoning proposal, not based on the actual development proposal today, but based on the maximum permitted density under the applied for um, zoning changes and the impacts a lower quality design might have that that or another developer might choose. And, and not to get distracted by the beautiful drawings and fewer units that have been proposed today. Moving on to the next slide and the final argument that I will bring forward today. Um, again, we've heard that the proposal is not in line with the current official plan. And to the best of my knowledge, the town also does not have any other plan bylaw, a concluded study, or a council resolution in place that would encourage or even contemplate high-density residential development in the West End or the Sunset District, as I've learned the town now refers to this area. As it stands today, the proposed development is driven by just by the singular interest of a developer. It's not coming out of an urban planning initiative by the town that would have taken into account the broader interests and goals of our community. Now, I have to say that I was very pleased to see that under point 551 of today's agenda, the town planners are seeking approval to commence the RFP or an RFP process for the West Visaga secondary plan study. According to the staff report shared by Matt Ellis with the, along with the agenda, the purpose of the study will be to come up with a solid plan balancing all the interests of different land users in the area. And it appears quite obvious to me that this study needs to be concluded first before facts would be created with the approval of this rezoning application. From the staff report, I've also learned that the sunset area might be identified as a strategic growth area for employment and commercial uses in an upcoming plan. And the staff report acknowledges development pressure that we feel today in this meeting for residential uses in the area. And and it concludes that the study is necessary to allow for a more detailed analysis of the impacts of competing land uses in the area and to find a balanced way forward. I was also happy to see that the secondary plan resulting from this study shall protect natural heritage wetlands and suggest appropriate measures to mitigate potential negative impacts of development adjacent to those wetlands. In any case, I'm very much looking forward to this study because the town would actually put the horse back in front of the cart again and take back the reins in developing a proper urban planning vision for this area. And it would do so before any irrevocable precedents are set by one of piecemeal developments that we see today, which would preempt the result of that study. I think we're all clear about the fact that the proposal we are discussing today is a significant modification of our current official plan. And again, and, and I might sound a bit like a broken record by now, but such a modification should be subject to the planning scrutiny and public consultation processes, similar to those that we had for the downtown development plan, which were quite extensive. And that study that, that's being, I hope will be commissioned soon, would likely provide for that level of scrutiny. So I can only encourage council to follow through with commissioning the study and asked to hold off on substantial rezoning approvals that may soon turn out to contradict the objectives of a new planning paradigm for this area. The developers should not dictate what that new official plan should be. That is really for council to decide. So let me conclude my presentation with my last slide. Um, 
we asked the town, no surprise here, to reject the applications, to rezone the property based on all the arguments that I've just brought forward. We also asked the town to enforce the preservation of protected bedlands, including the 30 meter buffers mandated by the NBCA, even if said property would be developed based on the existing R1 zoning, which by the way, this group would not be opposed to under those conditions. We have nothing against developing that land based on the current zoning. And we fully support the town to commence the West Kasanga secondary plan study as, study as we trust that it will include a proper public consultation process and will lead into an adopted vision for the Sunset District. And that's really what we want. Thank you for your attention. Those were, that's, those was my presentation. Thank you very much for that uh, detailed presentation. And uh, we uh, appreciate that you, the amount of time and energy that was put in by yourself and, and your neighbors in, in creating that. I know there are many more people who want to chat, but true to my word, my alarm went off. It's 1030. So I am going to ask that we, uh, we take a 10 minute break so that we can recharge a bit. I'm not trying to dismiss anything or delay. I just, I told you earlier it would be 10.30 and it's 10.30. So we're going to stick to that and we will be back to deal with uh, the continue this whole public meeting. All right. Thank you very much again. And we'll take 10 minutes. We'll be back at 10.40, please.
And we're ready, Chair Foster. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, again, from a bookkeeping or a housekeeping point of view, I will say that I've, if I'm still sitting in this chair, I've set another alarm for noon. So we're gonna go. Um, again, I do wanna thank uh, the previous presenter on uh, uh, for sharing his uh, info with us. Madam Clerk, um, I think we can uh, move on to the next presenter and, and get their, uh, their views, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Foster. We have a few um, members of the public that are attending by phone. So I would like to go to them next um, because it's a little more difficult uh, for them to um, view the meeting. So if we could go to next, Jeff Dennis. Jeff, if you can hear me, would you please unmute yourself? Hi, Dina. Hi, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, good. The floor is yours, sir. Are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. I, I have a presentation um, about the wetlands in the back, the coastal wetlands. Uh, firstly, I'm going to apologize as I've kind of woken up with a frog in my throat. You know, hopefully not one from the wetlands. Uh, my wife Debbie and I moved here in 2016 as recent retirees for a lot of reasons. Uh, the primary one for us was because of the protected backdrop we had of lot 82 behind our home, which is the uh, lot in question. Uh, this year we learned that it's not really protected. And I'll give you an overview on the coastal wetlands. They're a beautiful and natural and critically important part of the heritage of the west end of Wasaga Beach. <clears throat> Pardon me. They protect our homes and families from flooding and the erosion of our properties. They're a place for people to walk and bike and enjoy nature's bounty. They help to keep Georgian Bay clean and healthy, and they play a much larger role as a key component in mitigating global warming. So what are those coastlands? Well, the coastal wetlands behind us in Lot 82 and Lot 11, which is adjacent to Lot 82, are freshwater wetlands that absorb water from coastal watersheds and drain into Georgian Bay. They play the role of a natural kidney. They absorb and filter out contaminants and release clean filtered water via streams or as groundwater, which we use as drinking water. They sequester and store large volumes of carbon, releasing it as oxygen. They provide flood and erosion control to protect the homes of local residents. Uh, they provide a home and sanctuary for many species, including a wide variety of birds, bees, wasps, small animals, aquatic creatures such as turtles and frogs and snakes. And they play a major role in mitigating the impact of global warming. Um, and unfortunately you can't see my presentation, but I've got a, a shot of a hydrologic cycle on my screen. Now what a typical hydrologic cycle is, it leads to the formation of wetlands and marshes and swamps. Water from precipitation routed via watersheds pulls and settles into the wetlands, marshes, and swamps. From there, water seeps, it, seeps into the ground, becoming groundwater. Surface water runs downhill to streams, creeks, rivers, and finds its way to larger bodies of water, such as Georgian Bay. As our world heats up, it's getting wetter as global warming draws more moisture into the atmosphere. Storms are becoming much larger and more violent, and this cycle gets worse and it will get much worse. The ecosystems are getting wetter and this extra water is flowing to lakes, rivers, streams, etc. We need more wetlands to absorb this water and mitigate the risk of contamination, flooding and erosion. Based on the output of my uh, sump system in 2020 and 21, lot 82 is much wetter than ever and it's doing our, its job to protect our homes. Uh, the impact of their destruction uh, the precious cycle of absorbing and filtering water, cleaning our air and mitigating the runoff to Georgian Bay will be lost forever. Water will run through storm sewers that are currently overgrown with plant life, garbage and debris. Larger volumes of contamination will flow directly into Nottawasaga Bay as they're not mitigated by the um, wetlands. The existing homes will be at greater risk for, of flooding and water damage. 
uh, the abundant and diverse wildlife in their habitats will be completely destroyed. This includes some protected and endangered species, and those can't escape. We will lose another productive ecosystem that will not protect us from all the serious consequences of global warming. And it's estimated that in Canada, 70% of the wetlands in our settled areas have either been destroyed or degraded, and that's per Ducks Unlimited. We're destroying our world one wetland at a time. Now, I have a couple pictures up on screen, unfortunately, that you won't be able to see, but one is a picture of a culvert uh, that's full of vegetation and really drains poorly. About 50 feet down the road, the water makes a left and flows into Georgian Bay. On the right side is the same culvert and the results of a late winter melt. You can see that on the right of the picture how high the water gets as it flowed over onto a neighbor's lawn and the road. It can't drain because the infrastructure is plugged up with um, many, many years of debris. What can we do to protect Brock's Beach? Well, we can deny this zoning proposal. Parking lots and vast areas of crowded buildings will not serve anyone but the developer. Maintain the property as R1 and enforce the recommendations and warnings of the NBCA. The developer's plan is to, to destroy it all, and this is 100% opposed to the NBCA's comments. There already has been some destruction wrought on the property as it is. And again, you, uh, I've got some pictures here of the wetlands in the back, and you can see that it's a vibrant, healthy, uh, very green and wet area. And one of the pictures also sh shows where the um, lot was clear cut uh, to put in a parking lot. That's really, I've rushed through this. There's a lot more we could talk about, but that's uh, in the interest of time, that's what I have for you today. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and again, we uh, we hear it, and it will be uh, become part of the the conversation moving forward. And I do really appreciate the fact that you're hit the last sentence in the interest of time. But we're not trying to stifle any speech. We accept it, and we will move on to the next presenter, please, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Den. Thank you, Chair. Um, there are just two more members of the public that are on by phone, so I'd like to ask um, Mr. Andrew Seal to speak. Andrew, if you can unmute yourself, and um, it is star six to unmute yourself. And if we can't get Andrew, there is one other member of the public with a number there, but I cannot see who it is and I'm not sure who it is. Um, it is a 519 number. Um, if you're um, listening, um, we have a guest. Would you unmute yourself as well? There we go. Yeah, hi, I'm Dan and If McGinn. you could just state your name and uh, your address, please, for the record. Yes, I'm Dan McGinn. Did you hear that? Yes, yes. hi, Dan. Great. All right. Dan McGinn, I'm at 108 Constance Boulevard, west of the uh, development area. Okay, thank and you. I have only, uh, the, my concerns have already really been expressed well by the representative from Brock Beach and the uh, representative who just spoke last. Um, I just want to quickly reiterate that, uh, of course, I'm not in favor of high-rise development in the area, totally unsuitable for the area. But I would also like to say to the city that if you do accept this proposal that you force the developer to improve the beach access. Beach access is at 74, 3, and 2, and Baywater. Because we know that the increased development is going to make a lot of people want to get to the beaches. And those beaches are going to be overrun, so they need to be improved. That's all, I, that's all I'm going to ask, that the each area be improved if let the development go through. Of course, I propose the development not go through at all, reasons that were expressed by the other representative. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Mr. McGinn, for those comments. Um, like I said at the beginning, this is uh, ju just a, uh, 
a meeting to get information that's going to go back to both the developer and staff and eventually it'll come back to council uh, for a decision but at this point we're just taking all your input I appreciate it and if there's nothing else we'll move on to uh, the next presenter please uh, madam clerk thank you chair and um, I'm going to give Andrew seal uh, another opportunity to unmute yourself uh, from the phone please Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Is that you, Jeff? I can hear you. Or sorry, uh, and Andrew? A Andrew. My apologies, Andrew, Andrew. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. The floor is yours, Andrew. Sure, Foster. My name is Andy Steele. I'm a longtime resident of Wasaga Beach, and I speak against the rezoning. Uh, if it allowed, it would show all developers that environmental concerns, the town plan, and zoning restrictions are not barriers to their wishes. The type of development on sensitive land in close proximity to Georgian Bay is unprecedented. I ask council to put the long-term environmental needs ahead of the developer's request. Finally, I suggest further public meetings regarding Substantive rezoning should only occur when the public is once again allowed to end in person. Thank you, Chair Foster. Thank you for your comments and uh, appreciate it. Like I said, they'll be forwarded on. As for the uh, your last comment about only having meetings when people can uh, attend, uh, unfortunately, that would require our. Uh, our planning or our building to to cease for several years if there was a pandemic and uh, but again we will take all your comments into consideration frankly we would prefer to have in or I would I think I can speak on behalf of council we would rather have people in front of us rather than on these uh, zoom phone and, and video things it's, it's not nearly as interactive but we do our best anyway thank you for your comments sir Madam Clerk, next Thank you, please. Chair. If we could go to Kathleen Caswell, if you would um, unmute and uh, show your screen, please. I'll just see if I can see Kathleen. I don't see her in the list of participants at this point, so I'm going to um, circle to the next person, and that is Susie Cohen. Sue Cohen. And same, I don't see them. We're going to go down to Al Mar Margus or Margus. And same, we'll go down to Andrea Ponsolet from Shoreline. Andrea? And next, um, David Robinson, are you available? Nope. Don Beams? Jan Penick or Penick? There's Jan. Hi. Um, Hi, welcome to sure. the meeting. Pardon me? Welcome to the meeting. Thank the you. floor is yours. Um, I'm speaking today to voice my objection to the rezoning of Lot 82 west of 74th Street and north of Beachwood Road in Wasaka Beach, currently zoned R1 residential. As an active member of the community opposing this rezoning, I'm doing so based on the collaborative research material compiled by um, Alex Schwartner and presented today. That being said, I also wish to express a more personal concern to the town of Westega Beach and fellow neighbors. My concern is that this devastating proposal by Beachwood Development Inc. will set a precedent, a precedent for adjacent lot 73 scheduled for 204 units and lot 2 for 55 units to adopt. Both lots have not yet submitted their plans. 
both lots will also affect our community. This precedent for high density zoning and coastal wetland destruction in an existing R1 single family zone community could result in tran transient seasonal short-term rentals after purchasing the town's short-term rental permits. It will not bring families and employment to Wasega's community and local businesses. It will bring people to our already overcrowded provincial beaches and to our only private beach, Brock's Beach, along Shore Lane. All these beaches rely on coastal wetlands to keep Georgian Bay unpolluted. These rentals, renters could also choose the quaint main street hub of Collingwood and Creammore to visit rather than Wasega's sprawling array of box stores and franchi franchise eateries dotted along Mosley Street. I ask you, why is it necessary to construct a high density array of two 215 units, which had no community value while destroying coastal wetlands? There is no supporting evidence this proposal is offering affordable housing. The proposed plan shows two six story condos stating 72 units each, yet the presentation pictures represent only 50 units. It also shows inadequate total condo parking of 135 residence spaces and 33 visitor spaces. That's barely one parking spot per household. Townhouse and single family reduced size lots show no visitor parking and MTO state there is no room for garbage and snow removal vehicles to turn around. In short, this proposal isn't accurate, truthful, responsible, or possibly a representative of their actual plan for lot 82. Many towns in Simcoe Gray and Georgian Bay vicinity are now rethinking the need for increased population that doesn't support job generation. Perhaps small is better. Is it better to wait for the town of Wasaka Beach Planning Department to complete an in-depth study and independent study, taking into consideration residents' concerns, coastal wetland destruction? Are you sure you want to set this precedent? to concrete over coastal wetlands? I say no. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate that. And they will be uh, considered moving forward. Madam Clerk, next okay. person, please. Next, we have Linda Lesage, if you're available. I do see a Linda, but I don't see the last name, so I'm not sure if it's the correct Linda. There you are. Yes, hello. Um, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm a member of the um, Brock's Beach Association and part of uh, my responsibility, I, I will say, was to go with a team door to door with a flyer. And we delivered our flyer hand to hand from Cedar Grove Park to Constant Boulevard. Um, it's important, I think, at this time to share with you some of the neighbors reaction to the flyer and what's happening in our neighborhood. People love to talk about their neighborhood, especially ours, uh, the enjoyment of nature. For the most part, a quiet community, walking and hiking trails, and then Ottawa Bay, the ever-changing color and the sound of the waves. Door to door also reinforced that our neighborhood is a cross-section of people those who have been here for generations and those that are new. Some shared the way we were, the hideaway inn, the pioneer restaurant, Tiger Rock. Years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Willie lived on the north corner of 74th and Shore Lane. Their dog, Toby, roamed freely the area, hence the name Toby Trail. People like to talk about their neighborhood and now they are very alarmed. The natural heritage wetlands in our neighborhood is now recognized by most. The coastal wetlands act as, acts as a filter, an important feature considering proximity to agricultural land. It is believed that the coastal wetlands are protected by the NVCA. The town will adhere to their recommendations to keep safe our neighborhood and our environment. Most of my neighbors believe that tampering with and then destroying our coastal wetlands will have an adverse impact. If we allow this to happen, there is no turning back. Drainage concerns. Drainage to the bay is never solved. The drainage just relocates itself. 
In the late winter and spring, deep ditches and culverts carry fast flowing water. The amount of pressure it builds causes an overflow onto main and connecting roads to our neighborhood. Sub pumps. Many homeowners have installed sub pumps, some pumps with mo phone monitors, battery offered sump pumps and generators. Some have purchased water protection plus insurance policies. Sewer backup. The building code now requires the installation of backflow valves at the street. There was mention of the sewer backup in homes a few years ago. Will it happen again? Safety issues. Narrow roads are not meant to funnel traffic from Beechwood Road. Deep ditches, no sidewalks, increase in traffic will make it unsafe for kids walking to catch the school bus on Beechwood Road. Signs. Public access to our Sandy Beach and Bay is at Sylvan, 72nd and 74th Street. Brock's Beach is a private beach. Signs have been posted at waterfront properties. Many people assume they have access to the entire length of the beach. Bylaw officers act only when a complaint is made. Casino. The casino property has been left in an unfinished mess. Perhaps we should deal with this first. And it's sad to say families are considering moving if this plan goes through. A direct comment was made, will the planning department and council listen? Will there be enough talk time for everyone? I of course don't have the answers to those two questions, but firmly believe every voice matters. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, speaking on behalf of council, we also believe every voice matters. That's why we're having this public meeting and encouraging everyone to voice their opinion, but hopefully keep it succinct. So thank you very much for your comments. Madam Clerk, next. Uh, thank next you, Chair. If we please. can have G Gerard Disaster, please. I did see him pop up earlier. There he is. There he is. Uh, anyway, everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Right. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, due to respect of the staff and council, I will uh, try to speak very briefly. And uh, as you just say, and uh, as uh, Linda said, every voice matters, right? So, my name is Gerard Duzast. I live. Uh, on shore lane in Brooks Beach and we've been here with my wife Isabel for seven years and we just love it. Spring, summer, <laughs> fall, winter, all season we just love this uh, quiet and uh, beautiful area. Uh, early May 2021 I you know by chance found out that a new development was planned just next to us right on Beachful Road and uh, as we have a uh, a small neighborhood, Box Beach, Shoreline Association. I had to end with with an email list of all the people living around to communicate uh, our, our neighbors. I did send an email to all the community to alert them about this uh, new development. And based on the feedback, and it was a shock for most of them because nobody knew about it, right? Even if it was actually coming very soon, which is already a kind of uh, strange. But uh, based on the feedback of our community, I, uh, with their agreement, decided to launch a petition on uh, change.org slash Beach. And as of today, this petition has already more than 1,857 8, this morning supporters who have been signing this petition. And just by, you know, communicating with our neighborhood here and a, a bit on social media. And we also had some coverage from the Wasaga Sun and uh, some press uh, coverage, but really just locally, right? Not, you know, trying to expand the audience very broadly. So uh, I'm not going to talk about the petition longer today because I understand that when I did share this petition with the staff, with the mayor, deputy mayor, and council, I was told that there was a specific process, which I understand, of by law. Uh, so I will present this petition in more detail at a future uh, regular council meeting. 
and maybe also a deputation. So I won't, I won't go farther than that. Um, and by the time we present it, we will probably have much more than 1,800, because, you know, every day, actually, this list of supporter, supporters is growing uh, day by day. Except on that, I will just like to highlight a very few points. I mean, first, uh, I totally support every point that Alex Werthner has been presenting today. Uh, uh, even if each point he, he, he did present could actually take more than an hour. So again, in respect to due time to everyone here, <laughs> and I know we have a few there, uh, we, he has been trying to be as short as possible. And uh, I'm glad that actually the Council has a PowerPoint presentation that he's been sharing, right? Uh, number two, I, I was kind of, I think it, I, I, I did listen to uh, the representative of uh, John's consulting representing Romana development, and I was kind of, I think it was, of course, an advertising pitch, but I was shocked that at no point, at not any time, they do mention that this lot is actually covered by 53.4% of wetlands, of coastal wetlands. I think it, it's shocking, right? Especially knowing that the NBCA has very clearly commented and recommended the town to not uh, uh, accept this, uh, this uh, development on wetlands. Number three, and again, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be very short because actually we already had some uh, comment on the, on the wetlands. Uh, I noticed several weeks ago on the Wasaga Beach website, we had an active development map, which was actually dated June 2020, so over one year old. And I did communicate with the staff about it, right? Because it, it was showing like 985 new units on Beachwood Road, which to me was a shock. I didn't know it before, right? And, and um, I did ask why this map was not up to date, because actually the Romana Beachwood development was just showing as a consultation when actually it was already in the next stage, which is, you know, proposed uh, draft site plan. Uh, few, you know, I, I, the response was, you know, it will be updated later. We have a lot of staffing issue right now. We are overwhelmed. And in the end, what they did is just that they took, they removed the active development map from the website, which in my view is not appropriate because, you know, it's public uh, information that should be available to the public. So I'm asking the, the town staff to get back this active development map on the website until it's updated. When it will be updated, of course, it will be much better. When, before it was actually removed from the website, it was showing around 8,000 new units, not including the Beach One development. Uh, new units in Wasaga Beach, 8,000 units. That means doubling the population of Wasaga Beach in the next few years, when actually, the place to grow target for Wasaga Beach is only 20%. And I understand that lately, the council has been actually asking the county, Simcoe County, to double this uh, uh, target from 20 to 40%, which, okay, you know, if they have a plan to support it, could be, they need to bring as many jobs also that the uh, the target of people uh, is asking for, right? So, but still, even 40%, even if the, even if the Simcoe County, you know, double the gross uh, target for Wasaga Beach, it won't, we don't need these 8,000 units. And we probably don't need this new 1,000 units or 985 new, new, new units on, uh, on, uh, on a beautiful road. So, uh, I will just ask the town to uh, update the active map and put it on the website, or at least get back the uh, June 2020 active development map. And finally, another point. Uh, several weeks ago, I did uh, notice on the official plan of Wasaga Beach that there was mention in few lines, maybe four lines, and, and on the map, of uh, 
Western Improvement Plan. So I did consult with uh, with the staff, the planning staff. And by the way, I thank you for the planning staff. Every time I've been asking something, they've been trying to respond. Uh, and the response was, you know, yes, yeah, there was a uh, there was a the plan to do a, a West End Improvement Plan, but the, it has never been completed. However, we are thinking of, you know, doing it later this year. And I'm glad that today, in the agenda, we found out that there is a study and an RFP that's going to be out, published in September or October, right? So that's a great idea. I suppose any responsible town should do, you know, a detailed study and develop a plan before, you know, approving high density development in an area which today is just low density. So my question to the town, to the staff, and to the leadership of the town is, you know, can you please confirm that before approving any new high density development, any new amendment to the official plan, and any new amendment to the bylaw and to the vacant land condominium, you will complete the study and develop with public, with public consultation and public information a detailed plan for this West End. Uh, as of today, that concludes my comments, and I hope I will get some response to my question. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Um, I think we, we will be addressing that item later. I forget what it was, 5.5.1 or whatever. I don't remember the exact number. Oh, sorry. Councillor Foster, is your um, mic on your phone or your... Computer. It's on my phone and I should be. It's unmuted. hard to hear it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me try. No, I get it. 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 Okay. Don't do that. <laughs> we can record, hear you, but. Don't do that again. <laughs> my apologies. Anyway, I, I think we'll get staff to. Uh, yeah. address it when we're dealing with the item on uh, West End planning later in the in the meeting. All right. Excuse um, me, David. I don't know what you've done, but your uh, your audio is almost und undiscernible. I don't know what you did, but I'm having difficulty hearing you. Okay, hang on one second. Are you hearing me now? Same. Uh, okay, hang on. Let me try it here. Let me try it here. <laughs> if you'd like me to just move through the list of speakers, I can continue. I'm on my phone again. Are you hearing me? You might just have to speak up a bit, but we can okay. we can hear you. But okay, I'm gonna move closer and I'm gonna uh, enunciate. It is, it is better. Yes. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for uh, catching me on that stand. Um, again, I question my uh, internet service here. Uh, I was saying that we'll get uh, uh, staff to talk about uh, the West End study when it comes up in the agenda later. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you bring in the next uh, person, please? And again, if yes. if you can't hear me, just wave or jump or do something. Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Um, so if we can go to the next person on the list is Heather Szynski. If you're available, Heather, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, show your video. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? We can. I'm not sure I can. It's OK. I, can I just? Go ahead. I, yes. I don't think I can get my camera to work. That's okay. Go ahead. We can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Um, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Councillor, Council, and staff and participants. I live south of the proposed development on Beechwood Road. I was discouraged to read a petition against the development purporting to speak for all West Enders. 
I want to assure you that it does not. I support the development and I know that many of my neighbours do as well. Many West Enders want change and welcome development. It's been a long time coming. The petition states that if development goes forward, Shore Lane residents would experience a loss of property value. I do not agree because there are too many variables. We only need to look to the pandemic or to seasonal fluctuations, the supply and demand of lumber or to global economic shifts to see how property values can increase or decrease. The petition also drapes a large, a rather large environmental flag over the West End. This is confusing because in the past five years or so, I have seen more new home construction in this area than I've seen in three decades. And strangely, given the petition's thrust, much of that new construction has been on Shore Lane, specifically in the area of the proposed development. There have been many homes recently built there and many more on Betty Boulevard, Constance Boulevard, 73rd, 74th and 75th Streets. In fact, abutting the proposed development, Shore Lane has been extended to include a new cul-de-sac. These new homes um, are large homes that do not necessarily mesh with the tree coastal landscape. It also mentions an increase in unwanted traffic and talks about the new Highway 26, um, uh, sorry, in unwanted traffic and talks about how the new Highway 26 reduced traffic in the area. What it doesn't mention is the flooding that came along with the highway construction or the sad reality of an economic downturn for businesses along Beechwood Road when the bypass went through. Good people lost their ability to provide for their families. We want and need more businesses and services, especially for seniors. As a result of the pandemic, there is a looming economic crisis and we need to ensure a way forward for all West Enders. We need to look at the bigger picture and the common good inherent in moving forward with development in this area. The petition also raises concerns over flooding and drainage issues in the area. And he here I can concur that there is a problem, but the solution lies not in stopping development, but in allowing it to go forward. Since the construction of the new Highway 26, the West End has been overwhelmed by flooding and drainage issues. I doubt there's been a property more affected than mine. When the Public Works Department chose a site behind my property on which to build their new depot, I and others insisted on a comprehensive drainage plan, one that addresses the needs of the wider area. I have put a lot of time and energy into discussions with the town, the NVCA, and the Ministry of the Environment. As a result, the proposed development not only aligns itself with the Public Works Comprehensive Drainage Plan, it also incorporates the town's 900-page revised environmental assessment. Specifically, the success of the Public Works Drainage Plan is dependent on future development to help sol solve the flooding and drainage issues here. Public Works will make use of a stormwater management pond and a channel that will run through Category 1 and Category 2 natural heritage areas. The plan also includes new infrastructure and a culvert that will more efficiently direct water to the bay. Channeling will help direct flooding away from built up areas, including my property. To this end, the petition against development actually stands in the way of solving the flooding and drainage issues for many West Enders. Conversely, what I am currently seeing as development in the West End, especially along Shore Lane, does not include a comprehensive drainage plan that will benefit the wider area. Here is what is happening on Shore Lane, Constance Boulevard, Betty Boulevard, and other similar areas. A cottage is tore down, torn down and replaced with a large home or larger lots are subdivided into two um, 
two or three lots and more homes are built. Um, there has been no mention of the impact on the environment or the coastal shoreline during that process. Um, but so far, there has been so many individual homes built, 60 plus homes plus a cul-de-sac, that when considered collectively, they constitute a sub subdivision-like development. I'm not saying that these builds did not require some assessment reports or drainage plans. What I am saying is that the plans did not need to be comprehensive. They did not need to consider the flooding and drainage issues in the wider West End. Whereas the proposed development does look at the bigger picture, does plan to incorporate a comprehensive drainage plan, and must adhere to extensive environmental guidelines and conduct area-wide assessments. As for protecting the environment, there are strict guidelines in place today that go a long way in protecting the environment while at the same time meet the needs of people and communities. The town of Wasaga Beach in particular has shown a strong interest in new age planning demonstrated by the introduction of planning nodes customized towards efficiency and best use scenarios. I am confident that the town, the Ministry of the Environment, the NVCA, and the developer, developers will follow predetermined regulations and guidelines. Lastly, I'd like to note that there is a housing crisis in Ontario, and specifically in Wasaga Beach and the surrounding area. We need this development and future development in the West End. With it will come much needed services and businesses, and the area once again will be able to support families. With the pandemic comes the possibility of an economic downturn. Now more than ever, we need to create jobs and build homes. We all need to do our part to keep the economy going forward. Please vote in favor of the development. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, again, I'll reiterate, we're not voting today on, on anything related to this. We're getting your input and, and it might have been contrary to some of the other ones, but we do appreciate it. Planning staff and the developer will take that into consideration before it does come to council for further discussion. Madam Clerk, I'll ask for the next, and you're hearing me okay now? Yes. Okay. I'll ask for the next uh, person, please. Great, the, uh, Cheryl Wilson, are you um, in the meeting and available to unmute? There we go. You hear me okay? We can. Okay, um, I just want to, I live um, just north of the proposed subdivision and I wanna thank a lot of people who have spoken out about this because I think it's critical that we really take a look at some of the key issues here that don't seem to have gone through a lot of planning, such as the wetlands, um, a storm pond. I can't imagine how you could um, conceivably think that a storm pond is going to handle what a previous wetland has done. And I think it talked about 15 hectares or, or acres. I can't remember, remember which one was listed. Um, it, it just seems like we'd be taking a one gallon bucket and pouring 10 gallons of water into it during a fierce storm and people will have flooding. I think that neighboring areas will have additional flooding as well, established areas. So I think some of these are the really critical things. Plus we need to protect our, our wetlands as well. So thanks for the time. All right, thank you very much for your comments. Um, we'll move on to the next person, please, Clerk, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We have Nick and or Amanda Cercado. And just scrolling through the list, I'm not seeing them. So I'm going to move to uh, Richard Cupa. Bearing in mind, oh, he is there. Okay. I was just going to say, Bearing in mind, some of the people were mentioned on the very first presentation. So uh, anyway, my apologies, please carry on. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak on the application today. My name is Richard Cupa. 
I have been coming to Shore Lane for over 80 years. I purchased our, we purchased our seasonal family cottage at 2022 Shore Lane over 55 years ago, what was then the township of Nottawasaga. Are you still there, Richard? We've lost your... Looks like you hit mute. Oh, I didn't hit anything. Sorry, we're we're back on. I apologize. We hear you. Go ahead. Um, go back. Our cottage was built in 1921. Lots were created by clear cut, and seasonal cottages built without building codes, drainage plans, or lot protection. Back then, they would never have believed that the level of which adjacent areas were clear cut and the number of additional season cottages constructed. In 1965, when we bought our seasonal cottage, we could not have predicted the majority of properties along Shore Lane and surrounding area would have been turned into year round second homes of primary residents and many valued at over a million dollars. The addition of public water and sewers uh, to the annex lands in 1994 drove that development just as it did to the eastern part of the annex when added in 1974. The character of Shore Lane has changed three times in my lifetime with little of its original heritage of the 1920s remaining. Times change. The population has grown and the pandemic has changed how we live and more protractively how we work. With remote work, there has been a migration to smaller towns, a trend that will continue. We have not built enough housing to accommodate our growing resident and immigration populations which have created a supply crunch. Development is marching northward and no community is immune. The town's official plan uh, 204 was woefully unprepared to handle these changes and we look forward to participating in the development of the new plan which is underway. As a former chairman of the Committee of Adjustment for the City of Toronto, Etobicoke and York area, I have reviewed small and large projects, participated in many decisions that affect the community, its residents. I have reviewed all the documentation provided by the town for this development in detail and are very familiar with the lands and surrounding areas. Question is, how does the application on its merits benefit our community? It will provide much needed housing as directed by the province too. The housing created will be less expensive than many of the homes in the immediate area, providing a more affordable option for buyers as directed by the province. In lieu of a cash development payment to the town, the developer has made a commitment to provide land for a town-maintained public park. The townhouses and detached dwellings and street water will naturally flow to the existing drainage out for it. The parking lot and roof water of the condominium rain rush will be directed to a containment pond maintained by the beachwood and drained to the bay. There are also ripple effects. There have been concerns along Shore Lane about water flooding, private lands creating an outflow that damages homes, private property, and beach, due to the town not addressing the responsibility to ditch draining and maintenance. After over 50 years of pressing the township subsequently the town to do something, the town has now undertaken a drain study Shore Lane from 71st Street to past 74th Street. Trans Canada Energy purchased lands adjacent to the development to install electric cables and has indicated they will work with the community to possibly increase the size of the park and provide access to the lake. I was born in the village of Long Branch, township of Etobicoke, where I was resided my entire life. Over time, it became part of the city of Toronto. I worked in the town of Port Credit Township of Toronto, which became part of the city of Mississauga. Much changed. Some of it was welcomed. Some, pardon me. 
become harder to accept, but the needle moves on. No community remains stagnant. The beachful development will not be the last for the area. There are vacant lands to the south and north of Beachwood, and Cedar Grove and Jelly Bean Parks have sufficient pooling. <clears throat> it is my hope as the town of Wasaga Beach moves forward, it learns from what its neighboring towns and cities got right. I am in support of the Beachwood development, and it is the right time for the project needed in the community at this time and its direct benefits to the local residents and the ripple of events to the surrounding area are positive. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. They will be, uh, again, added to the uh, discussion moving forward. Appreciate that. Uh, Madam Clerk, next person, please. Next, we have uh, Liam Vu. If you're there, Liam. Please start your video and your mic. Liam may have left the meeting. He was there earlier. He was there earlier, but he yeah. may have left. Um, I just, next... Before you go on, I just want to comment on uh, Gerard Desastre said he loves the beach year round. His little screensaver is him on a snowmobile. I go, wrong time of year to have that, but good on him. Anyway, next, please. Next, we have uh, Kenneth and or Donna Martin. Yeah, I don't see them on either. So we'll go to Brand. Oh, sorry, no. Joe Mowdy. Joe, are you there? Yes, I am. Can someone hear me? You, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, give my presentation. I want to start off by saying when my wife and I retired over nine years ago, we actively searched for a location that we could call our new home. And after almost one year of searching, we located our perfect abode on the west side of Shore Lane in Wasaga Beach. We were very impressed with its idyllic, peaceful, picturesque landscape and character and its lush green wetland habitat that was located across from our home. Uh, by the way, I reside at 2250 Shore Lane. Furthermore, all of our homes were single dwelling, R1 zoning, and mostly shared a unique character and, and consistency. Prior to purchasing our home, we did all our research to investigate whether there might be any adversarial impact affecting the neighborhood. During our research, we discovered the official plan had zoned the area of low density residential R1. This was for many years and that medium density residential development is specifically discouraged within the following area, the outlying west of um, area west of the town, more specifically west of 71st Street. We also discovered that more than 50% of the proposed site are protected as coastal wetlands, designated natural heritage category one and two wetlands. The town has received comments from the NDCA indicating that they cannot support the proposal as construction would remove and irrevocably destroy wetlands. The town decided to protect these wetlands in an official plan amendment adopted in 2011 and have identified them as contributing to the natural heritage of our community. Based on all of our extensive research, including a plethora of documents received from the town and the NBCA, we were able to conclude that the area would remain zoned as R1 and that the wetlands, wildlife, and the existing natural habitat and heritage hiking trails would remain as is. Subsequently, we decided to purchase their home based on this information. As you can imagine, we were horrified to learn a few years later that Roman Construction, and the, the, who is the developer, would attempt to destroy this community and natural ecological habitat. The developer was not finished with the, was not satisfied with developing a subdivision with the present R1 zoning and leaving the valuable wetlands water area intact. He's now attempting to amend the present zoning from R1, low density, not even to R2, or even R3, but to quadruple the zoning request all the way to R4 high density. This is a massive developer-driven application that cannot be sustained by the neighborhood or the negative 
environmental impact that are at stake, including potential flooding of our basements and the devaluation of our homes. This enormous application for rezoning to high density our forests completely inconsistent with the true character and fabric of this quaint neighborhood that we call our home. I often drive by that Blue Water subdivision just west of our home off Beachwood Drive and admire the character, consistency, and uniformity of this charming R1 zone community. We would love to see the same construct within our own community and not have to deal with this R4 zoning just so that the developer can further thicken his wallet at the expense of our neighborhood or our wetland, valuable wetlands, ecology, and watershed area. Historically, the homes in this area are modest in height. They're generally bungalows and two stories and allow for considerable green space set back to their properties, including inc introducing this two six story condominium or possible rental apartments, which could be the outcome eventually with large asphalt paving uh, paved areas, no green space uh, to, to really uh, complement the subdivision and with both semi-detached and townhomes with reduced frontage and setback will fundamentally change the very fabric of our Shore Lane neighborhood. Why should a developer be allowed to amend this zoning from R1 to R4 in order to build a development that is offensive to our community? Squeeze in an overflow of people, obliterate the natural habitat that once was full of mature trees, reptile, fauna, birds, animals, and necessary wetland required to keep our rivers, lakes, and bays clean. A development that brings absolutely no value to the community and harms adjacent existing single family homes through water drainage, straining the current, it strains the current archaic infrastructure that we have. If allowed to build, they will dump 650 people into a small area. Where are these people gonna go uh, once they leave their doors? Where will, where will the cars exit, Shore Lane? Barely a two lane uh, road, uh, if you call it a road, with no sidewalks, no curbs, that, and a designated as a trail. Not to mention the developer's application to transform a heavily used natural well treat heritage hiking trail that exists between Shore Lane and Betty Boulevard into a main asphalt roadway. All that our community expects is that any future development in this area will be handled in a fashion consistent with our present low density neighborhood and also to take in consideration the ecological and environmental impact. This should be prioritized ahead of a developer who could be considered exploiting an existing community and the natural landscape for the purpose of profits. To summarize, I am, I am pleading with the town planning uh, department not to support all three of the Beachwood development applications that were submitted. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Sorry, I just had a computer outage here. Can you hear me still? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. All right, I appreciate that. I've lost my main computer, but anyway, um, I will get it back to the clerk to bring the next person on. I appreciate your comments. I do want to remind people that we're dis discussing just the development, not the motivations of a developer. So uh, please keep your comments. And, and again, we will try not to reiterate everything we've already heard, but uh, keep your comments about the development itself, please. Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we have a number that I've just been looking through the list that I don't think are here, but I'll just run through them. And Barabolt, um, Andrew Neal, and Kathy or Guy Hello. Dorbeck. Oh, um, hello. Hi. I'm Anne Barrybolt. And my, okay, go my, ahead. Yeah, sorry, it says Dahlia Metherell. That's my granddaughter, but being not very technical, I don't know how to do this. So okay. how to change it to me. Um, there you are. So, oh, there I am. Okay, so um, I actually, I'm going to be very, very short. I agree with what people have been saying about the wetlands and all that. I also, um, my real concern is that they are asking to... Um, they're asking to change so many of the uh, of the bylaws. They, they're like absolutely everyone. It just seems very, very overcrowded. I don't know where these people are going to go. 
uh, for walking. My grandchildren walk down the middle of the road and we're not worried about them. I think it will change everything and I think it would be very sad. We've only moved here less than three years ago, but we've absolutely loved it. And I would really be sad to see the whole nature of it change. And that's all I have to say. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. And you did great with the technology. Than <laughs> that I wasn't did. me. Better I think that I was um, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next person, please. Thank you. Um, so if Andrew Neal is there, I'm not sure. No. Kathy or Guy Dorbeck. And I know I did see David Ellis. If you're there, David. Yes, I am. Thank you very much for recognizing me. Um, needless to say, I'm old. And I've been here for 70 years, uh, uh, save for seven of those 70 years. Huh? And, and I've seen many changes over the years and I'm, I've never opposed anything in my life before, but I'm very much opposed to the developers' plans this time. The, uh, the high density, this area does not deserve high density like that. And I thank you very much um, for, for listening to me. I, the people ahead of me have been very articulate. They've done their homework. And I really have uh, nothing that I can possibly add to uh, change your minds, but I sure hope you turn the developer down. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And our minds are not made up. There's nothing to change yet because we haven't had the recommendation from staff, but your comments will become part of the conversation moving forward. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, next person, please. Thank you. Um, we did have uh, Nada Farah. Um, they have indicated in the chat that they have left to go to another meeting, but have uh, indicated their concerns in the chat, and we will document those. Um, Julia Lippert, if you're there. Hi, I'm Kyle Lippert. Oh, Just Kyle, sorry, I have Julia on my list. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope that's okay. I'd like to, to share. So uh, I live at 1074 Street North and my backyard borders on the land in question. We moved here about eight years ago with, uh, with my uh, three young children and, and partner. Um, I agree with and I support everything Alexander shared earlier. I uh, thought that was a great presentation. Um, we moved here uh, kind of by accident. Um, we actually found this place taking a wrong turn. Um, we were struck by the beauty of the area, the sand beach, the trails, the forest behind the home that we bought. This neighborhood is a hidden gem. It's marked by a beautiful balance between nature, homes, visitors, and visitors to the area. My family and I, we, we love living here. We just, it's, it's wonderful. Our biggest concern is uh, twofold, the protection of nature, the forest in the area, and the protected wetlands, as discussed, and protection of the character and integrity of the neighborhood. The town and its residents need to think carefully about the main priorities and values they hold as the planning and the growth of the town continues. We advocate for a town that's marked by careful planning, including balance between nature and new developments, preservation of protected coastal wetlands, balanced neighborhoods along the shore, developments that consider the size of the beach access areas or the size of the population, and balancing developer revenue interests with interests of nature and well-planned neighborhoods. Julie and I, we request that the proposal be denied and the property remain R1, that uh, housing may only be built in areas that are not protected coastal wetlands. We also request a proper study to be completed before changing any zoning laws. This will protect the character of the neighborhood. And on a personal note, if this proposal would, uh, was approved, be very disheartening for us. Our magical summer nights will be permanently changed and our regular access to a gorgeous beach will be severely limited. It has already been a difficult two years for our young family with more than enough to eat. 
and accept the R1 as we understand the need for development. However, R4 was something we could never have imagined. Thank you. Again, thank you for your comments. And we will take those into consideration. Uh, Madam Clerk, next person, please. Thank you, uh, Debbie Dykeman. Hi, <laughs> it's actually Debbie Gruder. Thank um, you. That's okay. Um, I am a lifetime member of Wasaga Beach. I've been involved um, with the community. Actually, I wanted to say um, hi, Chair Foster, uh, Town Council, uh, Wasaga Beach staff and participants in the meeting. I am a long time Wasaga Beach resident. I have lived, it used to be George Avenue. It is now Constance Boulevard. I am part of the Nottawasaga amalgamation um, into Wasaga Beach. Um, and change is bound to happen. Um, my concern um, is very similar to Alexander Schwartner's, um, Jan's, Andrew's, Linda's, Gerard's, um, Dave Ellis's, um, that proper studies may not have been completed as of yet, or at least I have not seen them. Um, I'm concerned I work in education um, I'm concerned about, you know, whether we have um, enough space in schools for high density, um, because that obviously will be a more affordable way of living for some families. Um, anyways, so I'm, I believe that the zoning right now as it stands is the way it should be. Um, that's my opinion. Um, I do not believe in high density zoning for this area until we have the proper things in place. Um, my concern too, like on Constance, the traffic is, is a lot more than it ever used to be. We have no sidewalks. It's harder to walk. The streets are not wide enough. Um, you know, so I feel like there's got to be more things put in place than just the actual development of that land it's everything that's going to filter into that land too which will then be as well the the flooding issues that this area has seen um you know the wetlands and the development during that process um and a traffic study i you know i i believe that we had the new highway built and it took 25 years to get that in place um, and we haven't gone forward with that. It was to alleviate the traffic from Beechwood to the new highway. And um, we're just going to be putting more traffic in. So those are some of my concerns, which are um, with everybody else's that um, I've listened to today. Um, as I said, I do believe in growth and development. And um, I look forward to the town sharing um, some of the studies um, that come from this. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you for your time. Um, we'll move it on then. Madam Clerk, is there anyone else on our list? Thank you, Chair. Yes, we have um, Joe Pascardiello. Joe, if you are there. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Pascarello. I'm an owner of vacant land uh, on Shore Lane, just northwest of the subject lands. I'm speaking here today for myself and for Maria Pascarello, who's a longtime owner of property located at 2086 Shore Lane, which is just uh, northeast of the subject lands. Uh, we oppose the proposals before you today. Um, we support and adopt the submissions of Mr. Schwertner, which you heard earlier. Uh, but let me add a little bit more um, to those, uh, if I may. The proposals for amendment um, are a drastic departure from the well thought out planning contained in the official plan and zoning, which calls for low denso density single family dwellings in the area. The proposals before you are not requesting minor variances or tinkering here and there. They call for a major overhaul to the planning in the west end of the town of Wasega Beach. And that type of overhaul should not be entertained by council on an ad hoc development by development basis. 
that requires an extensive dialogue with residents, environmental authorities, council, other politicians, and a number of other stakeholders regarding a more comprehensive and holistic approach to planning in the area that addresses infrastructure, services, and most importantly, generally, what the residents want the future of the area to look like. So I'm pleased to hear about the potential of a West End study that was um, mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, people are, of course, attracted to Wasega Beach and become residents here, mainly because of the beach. It's right there in the town's name. Um, and access to and enjoyment of the beach and a beach community is key to the appeal. This proposed high density development, which would be slapped into the middle of single family detached homes, would add 215 residential units in the area, which would add conservatively well over 500 residents to the area, which is frankly likely a multiple of the number that live in that area now and doing so without addressing the increased needs of infrastructure and services that go with that density and growth. growth rather. Um, and those new residents will be, of course, sold on the proximity to the beach and very close access to the beach, which, of course, is a fallacy. And that's where the framers of the official plan already thought about these issues, and in their wisdom, designated development west of 71st Street as having to be low density. Why? Because they recognized that that area, the area where the subject lands are, uh, is different from and unique in the town. There is next to no public beach in that area. Higher density projects in the town have been approved near the public beach, but in the area where the subject lands are located, the residents own beachfront up to the water's edge by deed of land. That's why the official plan limits density in the area, certainly one of the main reasons. And so for context, the higher density projects in close proximity to the public beach give residents ready access to 14 kilometers of beautiful, or beautiful shoreline. That amounts to well over 1,300,000 square feet of public beach with bathrooms, garbage collection, security, policing, and the like. Here, where the subject lands are located, west of 71st Street, there are five road allowances public rights of way that include public beach. Those five public beach access points in total today total approximately 2,000 to 2,500 square feet of beach, public beach. That's not each, that's in totality together, 2,500 square feet of public beach. No bathrooms, no services, no picnic areas, no policing. Um, yet this proposal wants to introduce well over 500 people in a densely packed development in this area. Not to mention the precedent approving this proposal would do for further dense developments in the future. The current zoning is based on well thought out logic and appropriate and reasonable planning for the area. This proposal, with all due respect, is not. It makes a mockery of the planning process, the official plan and zoning, and frankly will make a mockery of what is now a beautiful community of single family homes that its residents are proud of and which the town should also be proud of and should safeguard. We hereby, of course, oppose the proposal in their entirety. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Madam Clerk, do we have any more, anyone else on the list? Yes, I have um, an, another addition, Scott Metcalf, if you're there, please. I don't see Scott in the list. Um, so if that's everyone, um, I've called everyone's name. I'm not sure if there's anyone still here that has not spoken, um, but if there is, uh, please indicate by showing your screen. And um, if, if not, we'll continue on with the public meeting. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. <coughs> so if someone does pop up, please wave me down. 
All right, I'm going to continue and ask members of the committee if they have any questions or comments regarding this proposal at this time. Yes, Councillor Belanger and then Councillor Kinney. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, yes, uh, given the amount of concern that was uh, received by Council, I uh, wanted some clarity as to uh, the status of the town official plan that uh, has been in process for some time. I think Council uh, recalls uh, close to two years ago, uh, the official plan uh, update uh, was presented to Council, which identified five nodes of intensification uh, within the town, one of them being in the area of the roundabout at the West End. So I wanted to clarify whether or not the subject lands were identified within that uh, original node of uh, intensification that had been presented to council and it was confirmed to me uh, that they are not. Uh, further, it was confirmed that there will be the uh, RFP for the West Wasega secondary plan study uh, and that the original presentation was, you know, sort of a guideline, but not a uh, final, uh, final uh, recommendation to council related to the West End. Uh, but I think it was important just to point out to council that uh, when the five nodes were identified that uh, these lands were not uh, within that uh, intensification zone. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Kinney, and then your worship. Thank you, um, Chair um, Foster. I'll be really, really quick. I want to thank everybody that took time out of their day to express their concerns, their uh, opinions, and their thoughts about this development. I think it's a valid and important process. Um, uh, for us as a town to welcome all individuals that have some concerns. And just of a note, I stopped at six pages of notes and I was very well listening. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to say that later, but way to go. <laughs> Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I echo uh, Councillor Kinney's comments. I think it's great that so many people took the time. Um, but I did just want to clarify because I don't want there to be mi any misunderstanding in the community with regard to Councillor Belanger's comments. Just because a property doesn't land within one of those nodes does not mean that they do not have a right to come, come forward to do something with their property. It could be an individual piece of property for a house. It could be um, some other development. It could be commercial. It, it could be anything. And they have the right to come forward and do that. So I just want to make sure that there's no misunderstanding in the community that just because a property is not in a node means that they can't come forward. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. Councillor Watson, you had something. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Um, maybe our planning staff and or the Jones group could um, be, um, be a little more clear. I, there's a couple of the opposing um, viewpoints here. Uh, number one, um, the Jones group in their concluding remarks talk about the applications conform to all the policies of growth plan, uh, provincial policy and also policies of the county and the town of Wasaga Beach. Ms. Uh, Alexander, who presented first, um, um, was in direct opposition to all of those points. And I was wondering if that could be talked about briefly because we've got two different things here. And I'd like to know which is true and which isn't. Um, I will open that, allow staff to do that, but I will mention that this is a public meeting where you know they have to take the information and call it out so I'm not sure it's appropriate to ask staff to respond immediately to uh, before like they just we all just received the comments from the public I, they're great but I'm not I'll, I'll let Doug comment on it but I, I believe it would be more appropriate after it's been studied and brought forward uh, for clarification rather than asking them on the spot Doug if you want to Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, staff have not yet taken a position 
on this application. We're, we're still in the information gathering stage of the planning process. Um, this meeting, as everyone is well aware, is uh, decidedly uh, for the public to provide their comments on the proposal. In terms of those areas of, um, we'll call it conflict, where there's a statement that there's wetlands and the developer has not addressed it as wetlands, uh, staff have not taken a position on this, although we are very well, um, we know what the provincial policy stipulates. Uh, we understand the legislation which uh, defines what coastal wetland is and is not. Uh, in the official plan, uh, there are there were comments made by the public that the official plan does identify some natural heritage. Um, all of this would be uh, reviewed as part of the ongoing process. I can say that at the next step of the planning review process, staff will be packaging up all of the information that we've received today. Uh, also, all of the comments that we've received from um, agencies and departments that were circulated and we'll be presenting that to the developer and suggesting that they review it and provide a response, uh, which could take um, uh, a myriad of forms. Um, so in, in terms of uh, what we've heard for the uh, status of the wetland, uh, staff have not yet uh, taken a position on that. Um, and uh, I can also note that uh, to any of members of the public that are listening in right now, that if they have any questions going forward or, or they want to keep apprised of um, the process as it moves forward, that they're more than welcome to touch base with staff and we'd be happy to, to uh, share any information with them that we have. Councillor Watson. Thank you, Doug. Councillor Watson. Thank you. I have several others, but maybe I'll, I'll leave it if we're going to take the position that we don't have enough information. But my question wasn't about the wetland. It was about the the uh, provincial statements, uh, the growth plan, and our official plan in the county, and I was specifically asking about that, nothing but wetlands, because there's two separate uh, statements here by, by the Jones Group and by the presenter that are diametrically opposed to each other, and I just thought it was would be helpful to know which was true about these statements, because one is saying it doesn't conform with any, any plan from the province on down, and and the other one says we do, so. Okay, um, I actually just got a, a text that uh, Brandy Clement has raised her hand. So Brandy, I'll give you the floor for a moment, please. Thank you, sorry, I didn't know that uh, you couldn't see that. I just wanted to add just very generally to that, that you know the documents need to be looked at comprehensively in that um, we can't take like the provincial policy statement, for example, or the growth plan and look at just one particular policy in it and say, okay, well, there it is. You look at everything together. And so comprehensively as a professional planner, when I reviewed all of the, uh, from provincial down to county, down to municipal documents, that is what my professional planning opinion is that we conform with the place to grow and we're cons and the official plan documents and we are consistent with the PPS. I do believe that one of the items was specifically referring to natural heritage. And I will just say, since there was a lot of comments on that, there is uh, an environmental impact study that was prepared by the consulting team, uh, upwards of 100 pages, I believe it, it was submitted. That is what has been reviewed and circulated. And um, now we're, we're you know, discussing the comments from uh, the NBCA moving forward and, and hoping to get those addressed as, as best as we can with them as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think we'll, uh, sorry, I just, uh, I think we'll uh, kind of carry on at this point if we can. Staff will, uh, staff and the developer will bring forward those comments. So let me go back to my script, read this. By the way, my noon alarm went off while we were here. So I'm gonna finish this. I'm gonna turn it back to the, uh, to Councillor Kinney and then he can decide whether we're gonna go for lunch or not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, comments received today will be considered and a decision on this application will be made at a future meeting as to whether committee will recommend the proposed official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and proposed vacant land condominium to proceed further through the approvals process. Anyone receiving notice of the public meeting uh, will receive notice of council's decision on this matter 
If you did not receive notice of the public meeting and would like to receive a copy of the notice of council's decision, please contact the planning department, leave your name and address to be added to the circulation list or make a written, written request to the clerk of the town of Wasaga Beach. I would like to add my comments to Councillor Kinney's and I think it was your worship. This was an excellent public meeting. I feel that people had the uh, first for the, everyone presenting everywhere were brilliantly prepared and had uh, you know their comments were right on on the mark so thank you for that it gives us all something to think about and it's based on logic not emotion so my comment it was never a Facebook forum today it was a business meeting and well done so thank you to everybody involved with that oh, I've got my official call that meeting adjourned and I'll pass it back to Councillor Kinney, who may decide whether we're going to take a break for lunch and be a friend or not. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Um, and um, I'm going to get consensus of the team. Is we want to get through the um, oh the sorry community service section and then decide because we are at 12:06. I personally can go for a little bit longer, but. That's me. Uh, yes, Your Worship, please go ahead. Thank you. I was just going to say, maybe we could just have a, a quick 10 minute washroom break and then we can barrel through the rest of this this afternoon. Your Worship, um, if I don't see any disagreement there, then uh, Dina uh, will take a 10 minute. My computer says it's 12.07. Let's come back at 12.17. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dina. Worship, if, uh, sorry, if I just may mention uh, public members, uh, this does conclude the um, public meeting. So um, you can watch the uh, balance of the meeting through the live stream on the website. Um, so I'll just be removing um, all the public members at this point. Thank you then. As a result of that, we're going to take a 10 minute break and come back at uh, 12, 17, please.
Okay, go ahead. Thank you, and welcome back to the um, uh, the coordinated committee meeting. Um, we've just got a request from one of our counselors with regards to moving one of the items from general government up uh, as a result of a previous medical appointment. Um, I'm gonna ask council if they're willing to do that. I, as chair, I am in favor. Um, and I'm seeing yeses, yeses, yeses. Okay, that's great. And I'll turn to our clerk on the proper procedure to do that, please. If we could turn the chair over to the uh, general government um, committee chair, which is uh, Deputy Mayor Bray. Thank you. Uh, and at this time, I will turn the chair over to our Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kinney. Which item was it, uh, Councillor Wells? I missed that part. It's the item related to the archives and the staffing of the archives. There were three options uh, offered uh, for us to consider, and uh, I'd like to speak to it, but I'll be, I'll be offering a fourth option um, for consideration. Item 671, uh, Deputy Mayor Bray. So item 6.71. One, yes. Thank you. Okay, would you like to go ahead and speak, Councillor Wells? Thank you. The, uh, the recommendation is for a combined position of a library, or sorry, not library, an archives uh, coordinator and a co meeting coordinator, um, or a combination of, of, of the two. Uh, I guess I want to speak to it in the sense that I'd like to offer a fourth option. Um, I think we have to under say, are the archives important? And if they are, and I believe they are, then we need to make it successful and properly staff it. And I don't believe that a half-time position split between that and a committee coordinator is sufficient to, over the next two years, to get the archives operating uh, the way that we would want them to be so that they are, you know, offering to the public and to our town, you know, a real look at our history and our past and all of the things to go with that. My proposal, would be that we uh, go to a, a two-year term contract for a full-time um, archives manager coordinator. Um, and then I also agree that there is a need for the coordination uh, and monitoring of our advisory committees. So it would be to not only go for the two-year contract full-time at the archives, but follow through with the recommendation for a half-time uh, committee uh, coordinator uh, to work with our advisory committees. Right now, I, I think there's a lot of con you know, con back and forth, not knowing who's in charge of what uh, with our historical advisory committee, and I have great respect for them, but their terms of reference do not include anything uh, with respect to the archives. It's a separate entity. It's a separate department, in a sense, within the town. Um, and so a full-time coordinator there, a manager coordinator there, would have the opportunity to, to bring that archives up to what it should be, uh, bring in volunteers uh, through, Julie, uh, through Judith Illage, and or uh, certainly any members of the um, Historic Advisory Committee that want to be volunteers in the archives, that's a, that's a perfect match. But they are two distinct entities. They are separate and apart. And the Historical Advisory Committee is just that. It's to advise council on matters pertaining to the history of Wasega Beach. It has no mandate to be in any way engaged as a committee in the operation of the archives. So my sense is, if we want the archives to be successful uh, in its transition, we need somebody there full time with the right skill set to, to, to uh, manage it, coordinate it, to get the volunteers in there and to get it open for the public in a way that it makes it for a good display. Um, and I, as I said, I also agree that we need a, a coordinator for the historic, for the uh, advisory committees. And that could be a second position, half time uh, contract, run them for two years. And at the end of two years, then we can reassess uh, their value and uh, whether or not, uh, whether or not that model is working. Um, it would require setting up a skill set for uh, applications for the for the roles, um, but that's something the staff can handle. And I would see the coordinator of the of the uh, archives if that's the case, 
Ben being uh, as, as a sort of manager coordinator, I'll let the terminology fall to Dina and, and George, but uh, it's going to mean a, a terms of reference for them, not a terms of reference, but rather a skill set. Uh, and uh, then they would be accountable to uh, or report to either Dina or George as they as they consider it to be the best the best fit. My comments. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Uh, I saw Mayor Bifolci. Uh, thank you. I would just say um, I I agree with where um, Councillor Wells is going with this. My only concern is if we start to change the recommendations that staff put forward. Um, to have a half position for committee coordinator. My understanding is committee coordinator really should have a good understanding of how meetings are run and the legislation and and uh, all of those types of things. So before um, just just agreeing with it today, because because I do agree with what the councillor is saying, um, and I'd look to staff. Does it make sense to send it back to just to put some more thought into it? Because I would hate to see us agree to a half position for a committee coordinator, but then find it it's really hard to hire somebody with that skill set for a half position? Or is that something that we're fitting in within our organization already or how that's going to look? So that would be my only comments on that. Uh, thank you. I think we'll keep collecting information and then we'll maybe go back, circle back to the clerk. Uh, Councillor Belanger. Yes, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Bray. Uh, I, I was kind of thinking in the other direction. I, I truly believe that the archives are moving to a temporary location. Uh, uh, hopefully they will uh, reside uh, somewhere else in the future and that could affect the structure. Uh, we've gone many, many years without uh, with this being run by volunteers. And I, I'm thinking that a uh, part-time position uh, could probably uh, handle both. I'm not saying that uh, would be a stretch or it would be everything that we want, uh, but there's a good likelihood that the archives will be moving again and it won't be uh, necessarily a standalone building and, uh, and, and the structure could change again. So to, to hire a full-time position and be committed to that, especially given I know some of the departments within our town, uh, given the amount of development and everything's going on, I just don't see this is uh, one of the top priorities. Thank you. Councillor Foster, I believe you were next. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, I, I hadn't really considered uh, the suggestion that Stan had come up with. I don't think it's a bad idea. I think that uh, perhaps it is best to refer it to staff given the kind of length of the public meeting and all that. This is a, you know, it's a significant item and we, I don't necessarily agree with Councillor Belanger, the uh, the archives, I think, has a actually a very important role in the town, and we have to be aware of history and the culture that we had in the past. And as far as I know, there's no plans to move the archives again. I think that's uh, you know that's a, a home for it, uh, certainly for the foreseeable future. But I do think that if we're going to be talking about a staff or a staff and a half, that uh, you know, we should be we should really be looking at, at the value of it. And I agree, having a committee coordinator is an important piece and there is, they have to know what they're they're dealing with, but also on the historical side, um, you have to have someone who, who has a passion and understanding of, of how an archive works. So I would suggest we refer it back and then Councillor Wells can make his case at more length. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kinney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to points, I think we should refer it back. And I do agree the um, archives are important and we should put what emphasis on importance that it needs, it should get. And I think we should refer it back to um, staff. Thank you. Thank you. So it sounds like the majority of the support is to refer it back. If I could just make my comments. Um, I do believe the archives are very important. I think preserving our history and, and sharing it is, is important as we move forward and make changes. Um, I question whether that position should maybe be incorporated within the library rather than the clerk's office. So something to be considered maybe when the proposal comes forward. I don't think we should be creating a position 
you know, a half a position because we want to have a position somewhere else. I think we should uh, create a position that fits best. And for me, archives is probably part of the library. So I would just like to see that considered in the report that comes back. Um, if I could get a mover and seconder to refer this. Count, uh, Mayor Bifolti, were you? Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Councillor Kinney. So then the motion will be to refer item 6.7.1 um back to staff for additional information is that complete enough or do i need to read the entire i don't need to read the motion because it wasn't on the floor right so then i would just uh okay all in favor of referring this one back and that passes seven to zero so with that item handled i will hand the chair back to community services to councillor kinney thank you Thank you, Deputy Mayor Gray, and thank you, um, Councillor Wells. Yes, um, as a result, me, Councillor Tinney, if I may, yes, go ahead, uh, please. My regrets, but uh, uh, I am going to have to leave the meeting, um, unfortunately. Um, so you're I'm just letting you know that I will be leaving the meeting immediately. Thank you. Safe drives. Um, as a result, we're going to look at unfinished business. We have none. Um, other agency reports, our fire department monthly report. I'm gonna read the motion as a change first and get a mover and a seconder, and then we'll talk to our favorite fire chief. Uh, resolve that the community service section of coordinated committee received the July 2021 fire department report for information. Do I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councilor Watson, and Councillor Foster. Um, Chief, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, your worship members of council. Uh, this will be brief, uh, which I'm sure everybody will appreciate at this point. Uh, the month of July saw the most emergency responses so far, not only this year, but for our fire department of all time. Um, we responded to 174 calls in the month and um, the last call of July on, on the 31st brought us to exactly 1,000 calls for the first seven months of 2021. With respect to notable occurrences, we attended a fire in a storage room at the Second Street LCBO store. Uh, the fire was fueled by sanitizing alcohol used for cleaning purposes. The alcohol was ignited by a pilot light on their water heater. Uh, the fire was extinguished, pretty well extinguished by the manager using a dry chemical extinguisher. Fire crews were there, ensured the fire was fully extinguished, checked for extension, and the building was ventilated. Uh, the manager was advised not to store combustibles in close proximity to the water heater or any source of ignition. So that's a good reminder to the public out there that all the hand sanitizer and the alcohols we're using for cleaning um, need to be stored in a, in a safe place and not near a, a source of ignition. Uh, there were three water-related incidents noted in the July report. Those all turned out to be non-emergencies. Uh, July must have been National Bad Driving Month. We responded to 12 motor vehicle collisions in town and we normally average somewhere around five or six, so it was busy. Uh, we continue to be very busy so far in August. In the past week, we responded to a stovetop fire, a garage fire, and a fire in the bed of a pickup truck that was full of maintenance chemicals for like pool maintenance chemicals. So of course, there's the high hazard there um, um, with those chemicals. There were no injuries uh, in any of these fires and damage was limited. Um, and the damage was limited due to the quick actions of the owners using either a, a portable fire extinguisher or a hose to start the extinguishment of these fires. So again, I do remind people, we do have portable extinguishers out throughout the community. Most people have them themselves. They are to be used if you can use them safely. If the fire is too big, um, you wait for fire crews to arrive. But if you can, if you can use these at the early stages and, and get a, a quick knockdown, it, it certainly saves property damage and protects lives. So. Good to see people uh, stepping up and doing their part. And we have been getting enough rain and, and continue to uh, to keep the fire danger rating at low as, uh, in Wasaga Beach. So that's where we're at there. 
And that, Mr. Chair, is my monthly report. Thank you, Chief, and commend it to your staff for all their good work. And I see Councillor Foster's. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question to the Chief, apparently our favorite Chief, according to you. But uh, um, the uh, I was uh, sitting on my back deck the other day, and I saw one of those, I think they're called Japanese lanterns, the, the ones that have the uh, a mini hot air balloon that people send off in the air. It was flying and went out over the lake and extinguished itself and I assume fell in the lake harmlessly. Um, I'm going, do we have a stand on those? I, I realize people can set them off, but I think they're both a pollution and fire hazard. And so I just wondered if we have anything in a bylaw that they're, or, you know, if there's guidance from you guys on that. Um, we, we certainly don't like them. They're, uh, the Fire Chiefs Association of Ontario uh, worked very hard to, to ban those in the province. Um, it, it, I don't think we have anything locally. Rachel's on uh, on the meeting, and, and but bylaw-wise, uh, it doesn't. I don't think we speak to those. Um, they have been known to start fires, so they, they are a fire hazard, and you're right, they're, you're putting basically litter into the air. It's going to land somewhere, and if it doesn't start a fire, it's still litter. So um, the stance on those is, yeah, they're not, they're not permitted. Thank you, Chief. Um, Councillor Watson, please. Thank you, Councillor Kinney. Um, I think that was raised maybe even by myself a number of years ago, Chief, um, about the lanterns and maybe with Rachel on there, maybe we should be addressing it because yeah, it's especially when the grass is dry and brown, uh, all it has to do is hit something and it's gonna cause a fire. So uh, maybe we should try and address it specifically. Thank you. Noted, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Uh, any more thoughts or comments for our Chief today? Not seeing any, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Thank you, and that moves unanimously six to zero. Sorry, uh, Councillor Kinney, do yep, we have I'm a sorry. mover and seconder for that? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Watson was the mover and Councillor Foster was the seconder. We good? Yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. You're more than welcome. Okay, let's move down to uh, 3.4 consent agenda. Uh, resolve that, oh, um, we did have one item pulled that by Councillor Wells, who unfortunately had to move on. Um, is there anybody else that was interested in pulling an item before I read the agenda? Not seeing anybody and not knowing what Councillor Wells wanted to pull it for, I can't help there and I apologize. Um, then I'll read the motion. Resolved that the community service section of the coordinated committee hereby received the August 19th, 2021 consent agenda items 3.4 through to 3.6 and that all the recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding items yeah, agenda items pulled from the motion and voted on separately. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Deputy Mayor Bray and Councillor Foster. All in favor? Thank you. That moves six to zero unanimously. Not seeing anything else on my agenda. Um, as a result of that, I will move the chair over to Councillor um, Watson for Public Works. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tinney. Um, welcome, everyone. We will now move into the Public Works section of the agenda. Uh, we have no deputations, presentations, petitions, public meetings. Uh, we have uh, two items on unfinished business. We have no uh, agency reports at this point and we have one item that has been pulled which is 4.6.5 departmental accounts so I will uh, 
read the, the motion that is resolved that the public works section of coordinated committee hereby receives the August 19th, 2021 consent agenda items 4.4, 2 to 4.6, and that all of the recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding an agenda items pulled from the motion and voted on separately. May I have a mover for that, please? Mayor Bifolci and a seconder, Deputy Mayor Bray. Is there any discussion on that? Seeing none, uh, those in favor? Oops, not myself. <laughs> that is uh, unanimous six to zero. The uh, 4.6.5 that was pulled uh, resolved that the departmental accounts for the month of, and, and I note uh, the mayor has stepped away. I uh, resolve that the departmental accounts for the month of June 1st to 30th, 2021, and July 1st to 31st, 2021, as reviewed by the Public Works Section of Coordinate Committee, are hereby confirmed. May I have a mover for that, please? Councillor Kinney and seconded by Councillor Foster. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, those in favor? That is. Uh, unanimous, six to zero, and that is the end of the public works section of coordinating the committee today. I will Councilor, pass it. Councilor Watson, it was five zero that Merritt stepped away. Oh, right, okay. Five zero, and uh, there we go. Thanks for pointing that out, Councilor Foster, and we're good to go with uh, development services, which is Deputy Mayor? No, me. That's you? Okay. Yeah. You again? You again? Yes. <laughs> you're, you're pointing to Councillor Kinney on my screen, Deputy Mayor. But anyway, um, development services section, we'll get into that. Um, deputations, present, presentations, petitions. Councillor Foster, meeting. we can't hear you. No? Okay. You can't again? Okay. I'm trying to move it close. Let's try this again. Can you hear me now? Give me a sec. I'm trying again. Can you hear me now? I'm going to put power to it. I'm going to speak loudly. Any way I can get there. I feel like I'm in rural Ontario where I don't have good internet. To... Are you guys getting me? Hearing me? A little? Oh. There we go. I'm back. I'm going to try this. Are you hearing me? Dina, I see you there. Nothing? Okay. I can kind of hear you. All right. I keep falling. Uh, give me a sec. Okay. I'm going to try and do this again. Are you hearing me at this point at all? Just a little. This is this is fun. Okay. At the start, we have no deputations. We had two public meetings already, which I'm happy to reenact if we have another afternoon free. Um, a few items of unfinished business. We have the consent agenda, which I'm going to read. There wasn't anything pulled. I believe, Deputy Mayor, you wanted to make a comment related to the branding exercise. Is that correct? Okay. I'll stop yelling and you can speak in a normal voice and people will hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. So with regards to 5.5.8, it's the um, request for a branding strategy and the approval to issue an RFP. And I just wanted to reach out and say thank you to Economic Development. I sit on the Tourism Advisory Committee, and I know we were tackling how to roll out the new Spark brand and really struggling, you know, as a volunteer committee to come up with, with no budget on a way to properly brand a community. And I think this report... Um, points out why it is so important to take our existing town logo, um, our wayfinding strategy, all the different pieces of the puzzle, our welcome signs, um, 
and put them all together and come up with one rollout strategy that supports the entire community with a consistent branded message. So really, really happy to see this come forward. And um, you know, shout out to the tourism committee that, that we're trying before the pandemic started. Uh, I think that they would probably have some good information to input when the consultants get working on this project. So just if Caitlin could make a note to, uh, to include the tourism uh, committee, that would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, that was just a comment. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Councillor Foster. We could hear you pretty good that time. Uh, just a quick comment on 5.5.7, the building permit report for July. Uh, I see here that we've blown right through the $90 million barrier uh, for construction value in town already. Uh, I don't know if this is a new new record, but I would suggest it probably is. Things are just a hopping in town and progressing. So uh, that, that is great news. And thank you for letting me comment on that. I can confirm it is a new record by far. Um, all right, and I was also, if you're hearing me now, and I appreciate that, I was just going to point out, it was mentioned in the public meetings that uh, uh, West Wasaga Secondary Plan Study, I'm not going to go into it, but I do think that anyone listening or watching should really have a look at it. It does, it does dovetail in nicely to our meetings this morning. So if there's nothing to actually be pulled, I get to read the consent agenda, ask for a mover and seconder. Uh, resolve that development committee, <laughs> a little early, George, the development services section of the coordinating committee hereby receives the August 19, 2021 consent agenda items 5.4 through 5.6 and that all recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding items pulled for, uh, from the motion and voted on separately. I know Councillor Watson is eager to move that. And Deputy Mayor is going to second it. We'll ask all those in favor. Oh, that's carried unanimously. So I believe that's the end of uh, my section. I'll turn it over to General Government, please. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Uh, the first item uh, deputations, presentations, petitions, and public meetings, we have none. Under unfinished business, we have Councillor Foster's uh, notice of motion, re-Indigenous education. And I wondered if you would like to speak to this before I read the motion? I, I could. Uh, if, actually, if the you... motion itself probably speaks to what you're going to speak to. Would you like me to read it? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it, it, please do. But I would like to, we have the, we come from a very, privileged position, um, living where we do and doing what we do and being here. So I do think that we have to be sensitive to the, the history. I'm not asking for us to do blame. All I'm saying is I want for me to feel comfortable um, moving forward. It has to come from a point of knowledge, not just empty words and a lot of I feel that oftentimes politicians just say things because they're correct. I would rather learn about it and be able to say things from a point of knowledge. So I think the resolution talks to the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foster. I will read the motion. Whereas as a council, corporation, and a community, the need to acknowledge the issues about the former residential school system in Canada that continue to come up to light or come to light is important. And whereas the period that residential schools operated in Canada cannot be dismissed, as every member of this council was alive when the last residential school closed, and whereas this history cannot be denied or erased, but more importantly can be learned from so that the same mistakes are not repeated. And whereas as Canadians, we have so much to be proud of, but we cannot afford to ignore areas where people have suffered through the actions of others. And whereas through learning and tolerance, we have the opportunity to chart a better and stronger future. Be resolved that staff be requested to research options for the provision of online or in-person educational services for members of council on the Indigenous history of our area, the challenges faced by the Indigenous community, and the history of the residential school system in Canada, and that a report on options be brought forward for consideration. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Foster and then Councillor Kinney. And I just wanted to point out that I have attended the um, the AMO conference for the last uh, three days, virtually, of course, 
but the final um, offering was a virtual tour of a residential school uh, close to Brantford in Ontario, and it was an absolute an incredibly powerful way to end uh, three days of learning. So it might be a great place to start. And uh, there's certainly, it's nice to see this motion move forward. So uh, there's no other comments, all in favor? So that passes unanimously, that would be six, zero. Thank you very much. So moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, I have at this point noted that two items are pulled, 6.5.3 and 6.5.6. .6. Is there anything else? Seeing none, I will uh, read the motion. Resolved that the General Government Section of the Coordinated Committee hereby receives the August 19th, 2021 Consent Agenda, item 6.4 through to 6.6, .6, and that the recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding agenda items pulled from the motion, which will be voted on separately, uh, noting that we have already voted on uh, section 6.7.1 which I don't think I listed in my items of exceptions so I will add that to to the Thank list. You, Bray. Yes. Um, sorry to interrupt um, 6.7.1 is not part of the consent agenda so we don't have to worry. Okay fine so if I could have a mover for the consent agenda Councillor Foster and a seconder Councillor Kinney all in favor and that carries unanimously. So the first item pulled is 6.5.3, the Municipal Law Enforcement and Property Standards Report dated August the 19th. And I believe that this might have been pulled by Councillor Belanger. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Bray. Uh, I just pulled the item uh, really because uh, in conjunction with uh, the rebranding of our town, uh, I noted that uh, primarily uh, our law enforcement uh, responds to complaints. However, it was either within this, uh, this report or the Committee of Adjustment, there was an item that they were proactively addressing. And I think that uh, it would be well advised that we would become proactive for blatant property standard issues. Uh, I, I talked to uh, extensively uh, uh, with uh, Doug Heron about the rebranding and about some of the things we see in our town. I would invite everyone to drive in on 92 Down River Road and look at it as if you were looking at it for the first time and uh, what the first impression of your, our town would be. I, I further uh, wanted to confirm whether or not properties that were under development were still required to meet property standards and I was assured that they were uh, but you will see coming into our town many many areas of weeds uh, more than two feet high and uh, some properties too I've uh, I've addressed uh, with residents so over the last month uh, a number of property standard complaints where clearly uh, we should have been proactive on the situation. So I, I think if we are going to try to rebrand and improve the image of our town, we need to look at what role uh, our law enforcement, uh, bylaw law enforcement plays in that. And, and I understand that there's time involved and everything else. And I'm really suggesting that the most blatant uh, issues be addressed if we're driving by them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more comments? I know I certainly concur with, with Councillor Belanger. As you drive through town, you do notice a number that are um, you know, blatantly um, ignoring the property standards and whether they're waiting for building permits or, um, you know, or the property is vacant. It certainly does look rough. I think the same could also be said for our sign bylaw. You know, we passed a new bylaw and there's a number of uh, businesses that aren't in compliance and our bylaw drives around every day looking, but they're just driving right by. So perhaps they could uh, open open their lens a little bit more and, and notice the, the blatant abusers of the policies and maybe uh, do something to, uh, to deal with them. Did I see uh, your card, Mr. CAO? Or did I see your wave? <laughs> 
No, Madam Chair. No, um, I just You're reached over. <laughs> okay. Uh, then I saw Mayor Bifolchi. Thank you. I was just going to say, I know that there's um, some particular places in town that um, have been um, an eyesore for a long time. And I know that staff work on them sometimes and different things happen and there's certain uh, processes and things that have to be followed. So just for the public, so they are aware, um, it's not that things aren't always being worked on. Sometimes they are being worked on, but because of the process and how long it takes, um, you know, it seems maybe like nothing's being done, but there is, you know, one particular one that I know staff have been working diligently on, um, just following the process. So to get to a point where they have the ability to clean that up. Um, but I think it's really important um, that when people see it, as much as it's a, a bit of a pain, they really should be calling bylaw um, themselves, making that complaint and, and letting staff know so that it can be part of the file. Because I find sometimes people will call members of council um, you know, I don't like this, I don't like that, but it's really important that they go through the proper process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to be clear, if a member of council contacts bylaw, do they have to provide their name and their address and does it become part of the public record for that complaint? Because yes, people that have reached out to me are sometimes hesitant to have their name on record for their their next door neighbor, you know, because name, you have yeah, to live sure. together. So, yeah, name, names are not on record. Uh, complaints are are taken in. Um, the names are not disclosed. So, uh, what we do, um, even if we get a freedom of information request, we do not. Uh, we will block out any identifying in individual information that might identify that person. Um, even their personal pronouns or anything that might identify an individual. Um, the nature of the complaint can be released, but not um, the individual um, themselves. If I may make uh, one more comment, I'm not sure if Rachel heard um, some of the uh, comments. I think her computer might have crashed again. Um, but when we're talking about property standards complaints, we do do um, proactive enforcement with that. Um, sometimes um, what the public may not realize is that property standards orders do take time and the individual has the ability to appeal to our property standards committee. So, it, and that committee can also extend time for that person to be able to um, get into compliance, which we, we have meetings quite often. We just had one last month. So it, these things do take time and they're quite time consuming and quite expensive sometimes for the um, property owners. And we do take um, a certain approach um, when it comes to property standards. Now, long grass is under our clean yards bylaw and we do proactively enforce that as well. And perhaps um, Rachel can talk more about um, clean yards and long grass and how we proactively do enforce that. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to outline too, based on a, a few comments, um, that we do like we do deal with um, property standards as well as signs proactively and reactively. So it's certainly not a matter of um, making a formal complaint. I believe it was started in 2019 um, to kind of rebrand our department to deal with property standards proactively. And for the purpose of this comment, it deals with property standards, clean yards, road occupancy, as well as litter. Um, so this month there was a 20% or sorry, a 27% increase from last year. Um, we did deal with approximately 241 proactive and reactive occurrences that do pertain to property standards, including a lot of long grass and weeds. Um, and just so everyone is aware, uh, we do have a new property standards officer that has been going around proactively and reactively to address a lot of major property standards concerns that we've seen throughout the community, as well as having our summer students um, have different designated zones throughout town um, and addressing any long grass and weeds that they see, um, just to make sure that everyone is treated fairly, that we're going through all the different uh, communities and areas in town um, to deal with those appropriately. Thank you. Councillor Kinney? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Rachel. Um, just two quick thoughts, uh, extending on Her Worship's comments about calling in. From my previous life, um, the more people that call in about a concern, not only does it get addressed faster, but it also feeds the file when you go to court. Uh, that there's so many people in the area that have a problem with this. 
um, and it helps there. The second comment I'm going to make to Rachel is, I'm glad to hear proactive and reactive in your terminology, but if you can pull out um, that we've done this as far as proactive and that reactive, maybe an update with your report, that is if it's possible, and I don't want to add more work to your work, but just highlight that please and that'll give us and the people that are looking at our stuff that yeah they're going out there they're digging and i think that's what everybody likes thank you thank you seeing no more comments i'm going to read the motion the general government section of coordinated committee recommends to council that it received the municipal law enforcement department's monthly activity report for the month of july 2021 for information if i can have a mover and a seconder Councillor Kinney, Councillor Foster, all in favor? And that passes unanimously. Thank you. The next item is 6.5.6, .6, the CAO's report dated August the 19th. Read the delegation of authority under Council's procurement policy. And this was uh, Councillor Belanger. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Bray. Uh, yes, I, I'm not in uh, favor of uh, this recommendation uh, for for a number of reasons. Uh, in the uh, library board report, it indicated that a consultant had some concerns as to the construction costs of the library and that uh, they were certainly looking for ways to reduce costs and um, you know, we just had a report recently related to the construction RFP where steel supply is an issue and uh, we don't know the impact on pricing yet, but it will be pricing. And my concern is the report indicates that the CAO would report through to the committee. It doesn't say anything about reporting through to council. But I believe if further cuts need to be made uh, to the facility, uh, that that needs to be an open public discussion of council and that council needs to be making uh, decisions uh, related to the construction uh, you know uh, because a hundred thousand dollars is a significant change the only other thing i'd like to state is that during the last term of council we had a beach management board that was given a uh, decision making power of fifty thousand dollars that board consisted of three members of council and four members of the public with related experience. And members of this current council were very opposed to giving that authority. And now to a single individual, possibly in consultation with the mayor, we're allowing a $100,000 decision to be made without coming before council. And I would not support that, thank you. Uh, Mr. CEO, would you like to speak first or would you like me to let uh, the mayor speak first? <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I'll defer to the mayor. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, and, and I was going to ask that George speak to this. Um, just for clarity, I won't be sitting in a room, Councillor Boulanger, with uh, the CAO making decisions of $100,000 here and there. Um, I think these policies are in place. Anyone who's been through a process like this for uh, the construction of the uh, Fire Hall is a, is a prime example. There are checks and balances in place and to suggest anything other than that is completely inappropriate and inaccurate. So perhaps the CAO could speak to um, how these types of things work for those of you who have not been through it before. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so that was gonna be my comment is that uh, once the project is underway, um, council's already approved the general contractor, the, the contract cost has been, uh, has been set. During the construction process, there will be things that come up that have to be addressed. And these are addressed through a, a change order process. And the change orders are generated uh, through the architect, reviewed by the project manager, and if appropriate, are brought forward for authorization. Um, either by myself or by the construction steering group. So in the report, it outlines what the different thresholds are. Uh, there will be reporting to council on what those um, change orders will be. But this is during the construction process. 
and things come up uh, during the construction that we have to deal with. It might be, uh, you know, the color of, uh, of the benches in the players' rooms, or it might be some substitution for one item for another item. So there's a variety of change orders. They all have a different value. The purpose in bringing this report forward was that there was a gap in the authority already provided by council. Council had delegated authority already to the construction steering group and it was pointed out that there was a gap there. So I brought the report forward to address that gap of uh, change orders of a value of between $15,000 and 100,000. Above 100,000, um, that um, there's a range there that's the uh, construction steering group and then beyond that range, it's council that approves the change order. So this would be a normal, a normal thing that we would be dealing with during the construction of the, the facility. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no more comments or questions, I'll read the motion that the General Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee recommend to Council that delegate authority to the Chief Administrative Officer under Council's procurement policy to approve change orders with a value between $15,000 and $100,000 pertaining to the construction of the new Twin Pad Arena and Library. If I could have a mover and a seconder, please. Councilor Keating, Mayor Bifolci, all in favor? Opposed, if any, and that passes five to one with Councillor Belanger in opposition. And then I would normally move on to 6.7.1, but we already dealt with that. So 6.7.2 would be the CAO's verbal update regarding COVID-19. Mr. CAO. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm solo today, so bear with me. I'll be dealing with the uh, provincial update and the health unit update as well as our command team update. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you may have heard earlier this week, the province has made COVID-19 vaccination policies mandatory for high risk settings, hospital, paramedic services, home and community care service providers, colleges and universities, retirement homes and shelters must all have policies in place for staff, volunteer students and contractors by September 7th, 2021. We had a discussion uh, at our last command team meeting about vaccination policies and certainly uh, municipalities across Simcoe County and indeed the province are looking at policies now. Uh, school boards are being asked to implement a vaccination disclosure policy for all employees. Uh, Non-vaccinated individuals will have to undertake regular antigen testing. Um, third dose for vulnerable residents is to be coordinated by local health units and that will be rolled out within the next eight months. Uh, children born in 2009 are now eligible for the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, so that means that all children turning 12 this year are now eligible. And the province uh, paused uh, the exit from stage three for the foreseeable future. Uh, current restrictions will uh, remain in place. Uh, the province will continue to monitor data to, to determine when it is safe to lift the other remaining public health restrictions. And this is a result of the, the cases predominantly being about over 500 per day. With respect to the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit update, as of August 16th, uh, approximately 80% of Simcoe Muskoka adults 12 years of age and older have received at least one dose of the vaccine, of a vaccine, and 71% have received both doses out of a total estimated population of a 604,000 people. In Wasaga Beach, 82.1% of Wasaga Beach residents 12 years and older have received at least one dose of the vaccine, and 73.3% have received both doses of a vaccine. Interesting point, we are number eight out of 18 municipalities in Simcoe County when you include uh, Barry and Aurelia with respect to the percentage of um, persons fully vaccinated. Mass vaccination clinics are winding down in Wasaga Beach by the end of August and pop-up clinics will be held at various, uh, in conjunction with various other activities uh, going on in town. With respect to the command team, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we met earlier this week and uh, we reviewed where we were at with the various services. Uh, the arena is operating very well at six days per week. 
Uh, so far, there has not been a high demand for Sunday bookings. So the arena hasn't been operating on Sunday. So there's people that want to book ice by all means. Uh, we need a minimum of three hours of uh, booking um, in order to call staff in. Recplex halls, meeting rooms, uh, youth center, adult learning center, all open at 50% capacity. Library is open with the requirement that uh, patrons stay two meters apart. YMCA is open with limited restrictions on the numbers in the pool and the exercise area. And as mentioned earlier, moving to the next stage of the reopening has been postponed indefinitely by the province due to the rise in case count. So we'll continue to monitor that as we move forward. Finally, uh, health unit staff have been uh, in town visiting businesses to remind them of the COVID-19 protocols about mask wearing, capacity limits, and separation distances. Complaints were received about some businesses not following the requirements. The emphasis of the health unit has been on education and educating our business owners uh, on the requirements. Madam Chair, that concludes my comments and I'd be pleased to take any questions that uh, members of the council may have. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to the CAO, um, I, I, I sit on a couple of boards of organizations and member of a few clubs and that, and everyone's struggling a little bit with, or a lot really, with what to do go, going forward and, and trying to open, open their facilities and about whether they can uh, uh, go to a vaccinated people only uh, or a combination thereof, trying to protect the members. And I was wondering, and I, I had talked briefly with, with uh, Craig um, a couple of weeks ago about it. And then one question was thrown back to me, well, what's the town of Wasaga Beach doing? Um, you know, now with this, if you go to um, uh, a council, you know, if it gets opened up for the public, go to a council meeting, is it going to be vaccinated people only or unvaccinated or masks. So it's it's a real dog's breakfast, I guess, trying to figure this out. The one example is the Stainer Curling Club that I sit on and over half of the membership is Wasaga Beach and trying to come up with, with policies. The, the, the consensus seems to be across the province that clubs are saying, yes, you gotta be vaccinated, but you can't really, uh, you gotta go on the honor system, so to speak, you can't really demand anything but uh, they're they're hoping to go that route but it's 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 really tough to know what to do so I'm just throwing that out if, if how we're going to proceed or if there's any guidelines that can be found out to help some I'm thinking of rotary clubs lions clubs all these things like how how do people proceed thank you Mr. CAO yes thank you madam chair uh, councilor watson that's an excellent question um, that came up in the weekly uh, meeting with Dr. Garner of the area CAOs. And uh, this is very early days with respect to the policies. Uh, there's announcements every day um, from different organizations. For example, yesterday, Maple Leaf uh, Entertainment and Sports made an announcement with respect to what they're going to be doing with respect to uh, visitors to the Scotiabank uh, place. So, um, Dr. Garner commented that the health unit is very much aware of uh, these questions and they're working on some guidelines with respect to uh, how businesses, local municipalities, even themselves with respect to uh, how they're going to conduct their business uh, going forward. So I think within the next couple of weeks, uh, certainly there'll be some information coming from the health unit with respect to some of this. And as, as I said, it's very early days. A lot of people have the same questions. And uh, as, uh, as information comes out, I'll certainly ensure that it's shared. And as you know, our deputy fire chief is our COVID-19 coordinator. And I know through his network, he stays on top of these matters as well. And uh, between the two of us, we'll ensure that members of council and the broader community are informed. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Watson, follow up. I think, I think George just answered it, but I, I really appreciate it. We could get the, the message out to to our municipality. And I know Craig's been absolutely fantastic about this and, and it is a changing land, landscape and everyone's struggling right now. So thank you. And the, the more we can get directions out, it'll really help our, our groups and people in town. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Foster. 
Uh, it was basically asked and answered. I, I agree. I do think that, um, you know, eventually we'll move to uh, two, two vaccinated people will be able to get in, and, you know, like MLFC or, or the Live Nation they're doing. I think it's important we have the, uh, we encourage the, continue to encourage double vaccination for everyone. Thank you. Councillor Kinney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I th really think um, our CAO hit the nail on the head. It's new and involving. Um, and we want clear, as much clear definition on what are the possibilities, not necessarily what to do, but what are the possibilities from our health unit. Um, it's not really a similarity, but I go back to the early 1990s when a lot of clubs are looking at my agency on, well, what do we do with people coming in because of possible criminal reference or criminal aspects and stuff? Um, we said to them, it's up to you to set your policy and we'll help you with your policy. So it might come down to, and I hope it doesn't because I think we can evolve past it, that um, clubs will put in policy you're going to have to have your your two vaccinations um, just to make everybody safe or safer. Um, but again, our CAO hit the nail on the head. This landscape is evolving and we as individuals in it have to wait to see what the health units, our doctors and our health society um, might come out as possible options. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Just one further comment on that, Madam Chair, is that uh, Dr. Garner did indicate that the health units are in conversation with each other so that the guidelines that emerge are somewhat consistent um, as they can be across the province so that there's not this checkerboard approach. So hopefully um, there will be that consistency, but we'll wait and see uh, once we get the information from the health unit. Thank you. Thank you. Your last comment is reassuring as a business owner because so many of our customers come from out of the area. You know, so when we ask them to wear a mask, they want them to know that no, we we truly believe we're following the local guidelines and we're incur you know, we have to keep our employees and our uh, customers safe and we're asking you to to join us in following the guidelines. So uh, seeing no more comments or questions. Resolved that the Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee received the August 19th, 2021 verbal COVID-19 update from the CAO for information. If I could get a mover and a seconder. Councillor Kinney, Councillor Watson, all in favor? And that passes unanimously. That would be six to zero. So the next section of our meeting is uh, closed session, if nobody needs a break. Resolve that pursuant to section 239.2A, B, and C of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended, the next portion of the August 19th, 2021 Coordinated Committee meeting will move into closed session to discuss the security of the property of the municipality or local board, personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees, and a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. If I could have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Kinney. Councillor Foster, all in favor? Thank you, and I will pass it over to the clerk to confirm that we are in closed session. Thank you, uh, Chair Bray. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment here. I think I might need some IT help um, with my tablet. So just one moment.
Please go ahead, Chair Bray. Thank you very much. Welcome back. We are uh, returning from closed session and we have three motions. First one, 8.1. Uh, that the General Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee confirm the recommendation provided by the CAO pertaining to a pertaining to a River Road West property matter. If I could have a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Kinney, Councillor Foster, all in favor? And that carries uh, six to zero. Number two, that the General Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee receive the closed session confidential memo from the Director of Legislative Services and Clerk for information. A mover and a seconder, please. Mayor by Fulci and Councillor Kinney, all in favor? That carries unanimously. And finally, that the General Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee confirm the direction provided in closed session to the Director of Legislative Services and Clerk pertaining to a sale of land. A mover. Uh, sorry, Councillor Foster and a seconder. Uh, Mayor Bifulci, all in favor? And that too carries unanimously. And with that, this long meet or this very long meeting is now adjourned. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Take care, everybody. Bye now. Bye bye.